Good morning, everyone. Buen día a tothom. Buenos días a todos y a todas. A este tercer día de la Time Use Week 2022. Um, hoy tenemos una primera sesión eh, durante esta mañana sobre la regulación de, del tiempo de trabajo, cuáles son las, las lecciones que hemos aprendido uh, hasta ahora y también las perspectivas de, de futuro. Eh, os recuerdo rápidamente que el hashtag de las redes sociales es Time Use Week, para quienes estáis publicando en, en redes. Y para comenzar, quiero dar la bienvenida a la profesora Margarita León Borja, que es la directora académica del Centro Ernest Lluc de la Universidad Internacional Menéndez Pelayo. Bienvenida, Marga. Buenos días a todas y, y a todos. Yo voy a ser muy breve porque la verdad es que no tengo el protagonismo de, de, de estas jornadas. Agradecer en primer de todo, a, primero de todo a Marta Junque y al equipo que, que creo que han organizado una jornada um, importante, interesante desde muchos puntos de vista. Vamos a tener en realidad, eh, digamos en el marco de la Queen vamos a tener dos, eh, la que hacemos ahora y la que después eh, realizaremos en el mes de enero, el 17 de enero, que se va a centrar en la encuesta de usos del tiempo um, que ha realizado el INE eh, por mandato, digamos, del Gobierno de España, de cara a ese importante, esa importante aspiración um, legislativa de tener una ley sobre, sobre usos del tiempo. Así que creo que tanto la jornada de hoy como, como en realidad todos eh, los foros que se, que se insertan en esta, en esta semana de usos del tiempo tiene, tiene, importante, tiene importancia porque intenta conectar precisamente investigación en distintos ámbitos del conocimiento que giran alrededor del, del tiempo y luego también eh, esfuerzos muy considerables de política pública que muchas veces son esfuerzos muy micro son esfuerzos de política a nivel municipal, a veces incluso todavía a nivel barrial, y que mmm, tenemos dificultades para, digamos, para conocer estas experiencias. ¿no? Y creo que, que, que esto es una plataforma para que podamos compartir también no solo los debates eh, teóricos, sino, sino también las, las, los, los esfuerzos uh, por implementar o poner en la práctica eh, políticas que tengan que ver con los usos del tiempo. Yo tiendo a pensar que el día que hablemos de usos del tiempo en el resto de políticas que regulan nuestras vidas, es decir, no cuando hablemos del uso del, del, uso del tiempo, sino cuando hablemos de políticas del mercado laboral, cuando hablemos de políticas educativas, cuando hablemos um, de pensiones, cuando hablemos de las transiciones que marcan nuestras vidas y que están muy condicionadas por los diseños de las, de las políticas, políticas sociales, pero también políticas urbanas incluso, ¿no? en los diseños de nuestras ciudades. Cuando consigamos incorporar de una manera transversal la discusión de los usos del tiempo o cómo interviene ese diseño, a cómo afecta ese diseño a, a nuestros propios usos del tiempo, creo que habremos conseguido de verdad um, un, 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 un avance muy significativo. Pero de momento, como no estamos ahí, um, tanto jornadas como esta, como, como un nuevo marco normativo que incluso desde el aspecto más simbólico intente dar protagonismo a... Um, o visibilidad al, al, a los problemas de la, de, la, de la conciliación, a los problemas del manejo de los usos del tiempo y cómo eso está muy atravesado por, por importantes desigualdades sociales, pues el esfuerzo creo que, que merece la pena. Ojalá que a partir de aquí haya toda una, una, una secuencia de visibilización de lo, que, de lo que hoy se va a tratar eh, a lo largo de 
de los, de los dos días y lo que se retomará también en el, en el mes de enero. Eh, yo voy a darle paso a Marta Junque para que explique con más detalle la jornada. Gracias a todas y a todos por estar aquí. También los que nos están escuchando desde, en streaming desde, desde casa o desde sus lugares de trabajo. Y también agradecer a Hiyu Chang, a la profesora Hiyu Chang, que, que tengo el gusto de conocer desde hace ya muchos años. Compartimos, de hecho, universidad por, por estar aquí hoy. Muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, Juni. Muchas gracias, uh, Marga. Hoy quería decir tres cosas muy breves en esta breve introducción que estoy muy contenta de, de poder hacer. La primera es dar las gracias y veremos a quién. La segunda es explicaros esta vocación que siempre hemos tenido de juntar ciencia y política. Y la tercera es explicaros la jornada de hoy, ¿vale? para que decidís también uh, cómo podemos participar. La jornada de hoy es una jornada de debate, de reflexión. Habrán personas ponentes que nos darán sus, uh, sus, nos, nos darán sus conocimientos y sus explicaciones, pero la idea es que hoy todas las personas que nos estáis siguiendo online y también las que estáis aquí presencialmente podáis participar. ¿vale? Es una jornada de debate. Como os decía, quería empezar dando las gracias al CUIM, Uh, porque es la primera vez que podemos estar trabajando en la Time Use Week con una universidad y un centro universitario para realizar estas jornadas. En especial quería dar las gracias a Marga León, a Ignasi y a todo su equipo. En segundo lugar, quería dar las gracias a las personas ponentes que estáis aquí. Hoy las personas que intervendrán, tanto en el panel que tenemos uh, ahora por la mañana como por la tarde, van a ser personas de diferentes ámbitos, especialmente dos. El ámbito académico, que nos van a explicar qué, han, qué, qué conclusiones están sacando de lo que, los avances que está habiendo en el tiempo de trabajo y la organización del trabajo. Y, por el otro lado, vamos a tener instituciones públicas que nos van a explicar qué han hecho y qué quieren hacer ¿no? en este ámbito. ¿Con qué objetivo? Con el objetivo de garantizar el derecho al tiempo a toda la ciudadanía. Derecho al tiempo a toda la ciudadanía. El lunes, la consejera de Cataluña, de, Femini de Igualdad y Feminismos, nos decía que para construir un, un derecho se necesita muchas personas ¿no? y se necesita ponerlo a la agenda y actos como los de hoy nos permiten juntar conocimiento desde diferentes puntos de vista, desde los sindicatos, desde los patronales, desde la academia, desde personas de la sociedad civil y ponerlo en común. Por lo tanto, esperamos que este acto ayude a, a ser un punto más para avanzar hacia el derecho al tiempo y en especial que nos ayude a una organización del tiempo del trabajo más equilibrada. Más equilibrada es un concepto que ya utilizaba la OIT, la Organización Internacional del Trabajo. Y nosotros queremos avanzar hasta esta dirección. Así que gracias a las personas ponentes, gracias también a las personas que nos estáis siguiendo uh, y estáis aquí en el público, especialmente las personas que habéis venido representando a sindicatos y patronales. Queremos que hoy podáis hablar, queremos escuchar vuestra voz también en las reflexiones que vamos a hacer durante el día de hoy. Y ahora, para terminar, explicaros brevemente. Empezamos ahora con una jornada donde el objetivo va a ser hablar y aprender de qué se ha hecho para regular los usos del tiempo en el pasado y en el futuro. Y empezaremos con una conferencia inaugural de nuestra ponente que nos va a explicar especialmente la flexibilidad en el trabajo, qué beneficios y qué problemas tiene. Por la tarde continuaremos hoy con un tema muy interesante. Como sabéis, y estaba comentando Marga, el gobierno español se plantea en esta legislatura tener una ley de usos del tiempo. El objetivo de esta tarde va a ser que las diferentes personas que trabajan como expertas con la Betui uh, han estado pensando 
sobre diferentes propuestas que podríamos incorporar en esta ley. Y hoy nos gustaría compartir con vosotras estas propuestas y estas ideas. Esto lo vamos a hacer en la tarde. Y para terminar la sesión, para nosotros es muy importante no solo hablar desde la academia y desde las instituciones, sino también escuchar a las empresas, ¿no? que al final son los centros de trabajo donde trabajamos muchísimas personas. Y por lo tanto, por la tarde vamos a terminar con un acto de, organizado por la Charcha Nus, que es la red de nuevos usos del tiempo de Barcelona, con el objetivo de compartir buenas prácticas que están haciendo las empresas en este nuevo contexto post-pandémico. Con todo esto, nada más que desearles muchas, uh, que disfruten mucho el acto de hoy y agradecerles vuestra presencia presencialmente y online. Muchas gracias. And gracias, Marta. Y ahora, I would like to invite uh, Hijon Chun onto the stage for a keynote speech, a speech on time flexibility and self-exploitation. She is a professor of sociology and social policy at the University of Kent. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, you can ask me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, can we have the presentation up, please? Uh, So I've been given 30 minutes to kind of provide you what would really take days to kind of <laughs> explain. But essentially, I'm going to try to give you a taster of what I say in the book, uh, The Flexibility Paradox, but try to make this into kind of set the day for the rest of the day, which will be really about exciting um, new thoughts and, and experiments on working time, but essentially I wanted to kind of try to start the provocation in a way of why we need to think, rethink working time and what we could do to try to ensure that we provide citizens with the right to time. Okay, so again, well, like we need to, I think we are at a really crucial stage of, of humanity, if you want, of, of modern day where we need to really reconsider what is working time and private time. And I would set the scene of why we need to do that, introducing my theory of the flexibility paradox, why the reflex, you know, rise of flexible working will allow blurring of boundaries can be a real threat in terms of the retrenchment or the, the, the retraction of, of private time, increasing kind of competition amongst workers and increasing rather than decreasing inequality, both in gender and other aspects. And one of the two things that I want to kind of bring into explaining why this happens is about work-centric societies or the idea of passion at work and the rise of insecurity. And to then to kind of conclude with what we can do in terms of the new age of, of work or new working time where I consider the Dadaism of working time. So just very briefly, what is the flexibility paradox? That's a picture of my book there. Um, so the flexibility paradox is, the, is this. Is that, so In, in very kind of rational choice theory, so if you have control over when and where you work, you would expect that people could just, you know, you know, just extend their leisure time. If you have control over the boundaries of work and family time, you expect, oh, you would just kind of dilly-dally. And there's still a lot of that in our heads. So it's like, oh, if people work from home, it's like, oh, you work from home, you're not as productive, you're not doing so much work. Or if you don't work the nine to five, nine to six standard schedule, that you're not really working as hard or as efficient as other people. But in reality, and I'll show you just very briefly the, the, um, the uh, actual kind of evidence of this, is that flexible workers, those people who have control over when and where they work, they work longer and harder. And I know a lot of you are nodding here because you yourselves have been party to this paradox. So why does this happen? So there's a lot of theories, and I want to kind of try to first introduce some of the existing theories there. So in post-intensification is this, is that once you don't have this very nine-to-five schedules or working in the office, like employers could actually make workers do more work without having to pay overtime premiums or without going against labor laws, such as the working time directive. So essentially it's that employers add more work. The second thing is about social exchange theory, essentially that, you know, working flexibly, having the opportunity to work from home, but also also uh, work flexible schedules, so again, you know, working a bit early, ending a bit early, working a bit late, and uh, starting a bit early, uh, late and ending a bit late, was still a gift. So 
Because you have the gift and you won't want it to be taken away, you work harder and longer as an exchange for that gift. The third one is about the fact that if we don't have to commute, and I know for a lot of people who work in Barcelona, it could be for many hours in a day that you have those extra hours gained because you're not commuting, you don't have to you know, make yourself all nice and pretty to go into the office, so you have that time left and you use that to kind of work a bit longer. And also because you don't have to do the commute, etc., you're less likely to be fatigued and you're like less likely to get sick and a bit of reduced of absenteeism sickness. Now, I wanted to kind of go further than that, is that it's not just those reasons, that there is a bit of a trend that happened with the rise of flexible working. And that trend is the change in what we consider to be ideal workers. So, when, with the introduction of flexible working, we've kind of had a change in the way we think about work and what a good worker should be like. And this also came with the rise of digitalization, where you know, many of us carry our offices in our hands and in our pockets, where we could always pluck it out and delve right into work. Now, that can be great. It could be incredibly empowering. And I say also in the book how those kind of flexible working patterns enabled a lot of people who were unable to take part in the labor market to better take part in the labor market, such as mothers, such as people with disabilities. Now, the problem is, because of these rise of that blurring of boundary and the ease of going into work, we have this expectation that you should be always on, always available, that you should always be tethered into work at all times. And what we see is that there has been a vicious cycle of increased competition of always people needing to be available on, to the point where it's like, also in a context where you need to be seen professionally, like as a professional, and to do that, you had to, let's say, respond to emails in three minutes, even if it's at eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the evening, because that's what the new standard expects you to do. This has been accelerated again, not just through flexible working, but with that other kind of performance measurements. Workers are being you know, uh, measured in terms of performances more regularly through lots of different matrices, as well as you know, having a pay now related to that performance outcomes of those workers. And this is really, these kind of patterns, initially a lot of scholars said these are like professionals, you know, like bankers or, or academics if you want. But we see that that's kind of happening across the board, and I'll again show you the evidence of this later. But so what are some of the two reasons why workers, when given that freedom, rather than expanding their leisure, work harder and longer? And I find two real kind of main kind of causes that could really help us understand the social structures that make freedom at work more of, let's say, shackles, if you want. The first is about the work-centric society and passion at work. Now we're in a society where work is your passion, that you should be busy at work, because otherwise you're not really contributing to society. That you being busy at work, saying, you know, for example, you meet a friend, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm busy. If you don't say you're busy, you're kind of you know, a bit of a loser. You know, you're not really an important person. So you have to say that you're busy. To the point, it's not just to show others. It's also to show the confirmation of self-worth. If you don't feel like you're busy at work, you're like, oh, what's wrong with me? And this is, again, evidenced by a lot of psychological, uh, psychosocial, social psychology studies, such as Beleza et al. What is more, if you look at some of the world value surveys, the international survey programs, if you ask people, back in the days, in the 1970s, up to the 1980s, people said, oh, I work to earn a living, I enjoy my family time, I enjoy my leisure time. But now, work is where I find joy. Work is where I pursue my passion, or social justice, if you want. The problem with that passion is that there's a theory called passion exploitation where if you're passionate at work, you don't need numerical compensation, that you can be exploited. Why? Because you like it. You're doing what you love, so why are we not doing more of it and more of it? So it's absolutely okay to exploit you, and you yourself use that logic to use the freedom at work to exploit yourself. To the point now, but it's not, again, it's not just professional. Even if you look at the very low-pay elementary occupation, interesting job, having passion at work is now considered the norm. 
But it's not just that. It's about insecurity. And those things are really interrelated. We saw the demise of the collective bargaining power, such as the decline of unions across all of like modern-day society, really Western uh, industrialized societies, but across the world. The welfare state has been you know, dismantled since the 1970s. We no longer have many you know, workers do not have income protection. And back in the days, in the golden days of the welfare state, people even had job protection, which is now being dismantled with the increase of lots of precarious jobs. Um, and what that also has done is that we've, individu you know, we've individualized risk. Before, when the welfare state was in its golden era, it was the welfare states to provide income and job security for workers. You could rely on the state for that safety net. No longer. We now have to hold those risks ourselves. We are responsible for how marketable we are. We are responsible for making sure that we could sell our labor to make sure to get uh, enough income. And again, this is kind of the idea of the recommodification of labor in modern day society. But let's just forget about those people. So let's uh, forget about, about people who are insecure in the more traditional sense. How about those in the top position? Those who are in, let's say, permanent jobs, good income. How about them? They also feel insecure. It's the idea of the increased performance management that even those in very kind of secure jobs feel insecure about maintaining your position. Because again, with the rise of matrices, as well as the increase of performance management, that we always feel like we have to be on our toes, working all the time, pushing ourselves to the max. Otherwise, we are not as worthy. Now, this is where, looking at the time, I'm going to really breeze through some of the evidence. If you want to know more, you can buy my book, or you can see a lot of the open access papers that I have that have published around this. What I can say is, so does this actually show in the data? What we looked at is German longitudinal data, the German household panel study. We looked at UK household panel studies, where we look at individuals across time. You follow the individual and see what happens when they start working flexibly. What happens? They work longer hours. You, um, other colleagues have looked at you know, American data, German uh, data, et cetera, to look at what happens when you work from home. Same pattern, you work longer hours. Um, there has been some experimental studies, especially not just professional, but routine workers to see what happens when they work from home. They work longer. Why? They don't necessarily work longer hours, but they get rid of their breaks, as well as they have less distractions, so they end up working longer as well. Workers have been also shown to do more multitasking when they're working from home or working flexibly, and also more likely to have mental sleep spillover, which means a lot of those who are working flexibly, and you know, again, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of you will uh, identify with this, is that you think about, well, you can't get rid of work in your head. It's just constantly there without you being able to put it away. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I wanted to say, and really important because I wanted to talk about the inequality patterns in terms of right to time. One thing we find is that men work longer over, uh, over time hours compared to women. Now, the question is then, oh, is it men that are more likely to be exploited or experience the paradox? And we say, no, it's because you're looking at the wrong hours. Paid hours is just one part of hours, well, working hours. Unpaid work is as important. When we start looking at unpaid work, we realize it's actually women who exploit themselves more, both in the labor market and at home. So women end up doing more unpaid hours. So for example, in a German study conducted by Yvonne Lada, a good friend of mine, she shows that Women, men increased their overtime hours two to three hours when they were working from home. Women increased their overtime hours as well, but just one hour, right? But what did they do? They increased their childcare hours by three hours. So they increased their work hours by four hours. So, but what happens then is, especially in situations where women are working from home and men are not, women will end up doing more housework and childcare, exacerbating the inequality patterns that we see at home. What that also does is it stigmatizes women's flexible working. This is why more women will be penalized when they work from home or work flexibly compared to men because of the social, social assumptions we have <laughs> towards, well, first of all, women and mothers' work capacities, but especially when they're working from home, it will exacerbate the perception of them not being productive, which will increase the gender inequality patterns in the labor market. Oh. 
And then some, also what we find is that with these overtime hours, overtime hours both at home and in the family, we see worse work-life balance outcomes for those who are working flexibly. So what do we do about this? There's so many things that I would like to say, but I'm going to talk really about the right to disconnect and right to time. First of all, oh, <laughs> I want to just first start off with explaining why the current labor laws are not efficient, uh, well, efficient enough. So labor laws that we have at this moment in the majority of the countries, and I'm very happy to see that Barcelona and Catalonia and the Spanish government, they're all interested in changing some of these regulations. But it is built around almost like a factory work stage situation. Like you work a certain hour and you take a break and you have, you're working in the office or in your workspace. And it's really inefficient when we start blurring the ideas of what is the workspace? What is working time? When is working time? And so because when, you know, when we have these flexible working arrangements, you realize that these boundaries of work and non-work time isn't as clear. I'm just going to skip that to the next one. Especially when, so we have talk, I've talked about the Dadaism of working time. Well, not just teleworking, but flexi time. So, the, the question of working time becomes really tricky because back in the days, if you think about the office work, and just for flexible work, uh, teleworking in particular, we expected that, okay, when you're in the office, that is working time. That's well how we considered it. We didn't account for the fact that you don't necessarily always do work during your working hours. If you look at a survey in the UK before the pandemic, they were asking workers, what do you do in your working hours? So you're full-time worker, worker, so eight hours, nine hours a day, what do you actually do? They worked, worked, real actual work, less than three hours a day. The reason was a lot of the time was spent doing other things. I'm not saying all of these other things are not meaningful, but I'm just saying that this working time becomes really tricky because actually a lot of the working hours are not necessarily that clear cut. So for example, with the voucher cloud, the workers day, they spend time drinking coffee, reading the news, talking to their partners, et cetera, et cetera. But all of that was counted as working time. Now, if you put that in the household, in the home, workers themselves will not necessarily calculate all of those hours that they would have calculated in the office as working time, as working time. So we're really in a point where once work is now taken away from the office and into a private sphere, then we're really left with the question, what is working time? Where does it begin? Where does it end? How, what can you count? Um, and who does those hours? And also maybe it's more about this. It's may not necessarily about what is actually working time, but what is the impact of those expansion of the working time? So, what I try to summarize here is essentially, rather than maybe trying to, in, you know, again, because it is so messy, to try to calculate working time and then try to restrict the numbers of hours of work, maybe we need to turn that the dialogue around to say, how about, forget about working time per se, let's, and I'm gonna talk a bit later about you know, the ideas of work about, let's say work, we have to do certain things. It doesn't matter how many hours you work, you do that, but let's think about protecting private time and rest. How about rather than trying to make a very kind of messy definition of working time that could be applied in this flexible uh, age, why don't we start talking about rest time? And this is why I say we need the right to disconnect. So rather than saying, okay, this is your working hours and you shouldn't do more or less, they say, oh, no, this, from this point onwards, from here, that's your time. That's your private, you know, secure time that you have the right to protect. So it is providing almost uh, the, an artificial, stricter boundaries, again, in this era of flexibility. So it's enabling a right to rest, mandating protecting time away from work, both physically and mentally. And that doesn't mean that you can't work at 8 o'clock. So you can work, but you have the right to protect your time. It's the same thing as when you go on holiday, you can check your emails if you want, but you don't have to check your emails, right? This is what the strength of the right to disconnect is. But it also improves firm productivity if we are allowed to do this. Why? Because study after study shows that mental, physical time away from work is helping productivity rather than decreasing it. So in a way, 
as the working time directive has tried to do in, with maximizing the working hours, what right to disconnect actually is, is not only about protecting workers, it's protecting managers from misusing labor, labor force in the wrong way. And also what we're doing is we're ensuring that the rise of flexible working, remote working, et cetera, doesn't result in social costs. I think what labor laws have to do is to understand that certain actors, such as managers of certain organizations, even with their, the, you know, the best intentions, may not necessarily see the cost that they produce. Individuals may not necessarily the cost that they produce. So let's say people who work very long hours, they might not understand the long-term repercussions, not only on themselves, their family, as well as society, in terms it may be health costs, it may be social costs in terms of the relationship breakdown, the cost it has on the children, the impact on children. What labor laws then need to do is to make sure people make good choices. The right to disconnect, and, and again, I'll show you later with the uh, rise of uh, the use of four-day working week, a uh, four-day week, is to try as a society address this issue that certain types of behaviors and working patterns are not good for social value or social costs. So we're trying to stop people from working very long hours, which actually results in you know, bad work-life balance, burnout, but also, again, social costs, not only for yourself, but your children and your family and for society. Again, it, it could be higher, uh, higher cost for medical reasons, but also higher cost in terms of losing out a great chunk of the labor force due to these patterns. Um, I think the right to disconnect is a good start, but I think we need to go a little bit further in terms of the four-day week. One of the things I want to say is this. The, so the right to rest is also about social inequality. It's not just about individual workers, but it's also about re considering who is able to rest now. I think there is a pattern of social inequality in terms of who is able to have leisure and who is able to rest. And perhaps the four-day week is really about trying to readdress those inequality patterns so that the right to rest is not just given to workers, but to all workers. So one is about this. And one of the great things about the four-day week that I would like to kind of uh, highlight is that we need to reconfigure work. So back in the days and, and up to now, we're still measuring work in terms of the hours you sit in front of the computer, like and use that as a measure of productivity and commitment. So, oh, those people who work very long hours in the office, they're committed. Oh, those people who come to every meeting, they're committed. If those who have face time with their managers, they're committed. And the, I think the fundamental thing about the four-day week is to say, no, let's not do that. Let's completely reconfigure what productivity and motivation and what the key indices that we, or the key uh, targets we have to meet as a company, but also society is. It also helps us value non-paid work as valuable. So by shifting the work kind of division of hours of like from 40 to let's say the rest of the week to really to say, okay, so we spend four days at work and three days at not work, we start valuing the things we do outside of work a bit more. It could be family time, leisure and voluntary work. And then, you know, that will help us shift away from the work centric society. And again, one of the key things I wanted to say is that we're removing the division between those who work very long hours and those who don't work. So in our current day society, we still live in this, again, this ideal worker culture where being available all the time, being tethered to work is considered virtuous. We expect, especially like in certain occupations, that you should really devote yourself only to work, work very long hours, and that's how, that's, that's considered virtuous. But it is incredibly exclusionary. There are certain people who can work long hours and those who cannot. And those tend to be those women with care responsibility, workers with care responsibility, disabled workers, cannot work those long hours. So this is why it's very exclusionary. But once we start moving away from that culture, we might be able to start introducing more equality in terms of not only access to work, but also the, uh, the, the value that non-work has. And also in terms of not only care work, but also in terms of other issues such as climate change. So I mean, just to sum it up, um, 
before I, I, I come off the stage, and I mean, this is something that I've been asked a lot, it's like, so am I saying like, we shouldn't work flexibly at all? Like, you know, like, because I, I, I spent quite a long time talking about how dangerous flexible working can be, working from home or having flexi time. But actually, again, one of the things we have to say is flexible working is a great enabler, a great enabler for those who had limited access to the labor market to really be able to gain access. So if you were work, able to work from home, work flexible schedules, you're more likely to take part in the labor market, and especially for those with other responsibilities, such as care responsibilities. Having said that, in this current social structure where work is your passion and we have insecurity, and digitalization has enabled us to be tethered into work all the time, this rise of flexible working is really increasing our tendency to work long hours in a hyper-competitive way and always be available and tethered on, which increases not only bad work uh, well-being outcomes, but also inequality outcomes. And as I said, that isn't just you know, harmful for individuals, but is very harmful for society as a whole. And the current labor laws, again, designed in the times where people were working in factories nine to five isn't really going to cut in terms of cut it in terms of providing people with the right solution. So we need a stronger protection of rest times. And I think again, right to disconnect may provide artificial boundaries to provide people with more right to say no to work. Because at the moment we just don't have that right as much to just say no and say, this is my time, this is my time for rest. But also four day week can help us really reconfigure the values at work and society to better use the really limited resource that we have, we, which we all share, which is called time. Okay, so that is it for me. Thank you very much. Very much. And ahora tenemos un breve espacio de 15 minutos para preguntas y comentarios de la audiencia a la ponente. Tenemos una persona por aquí, Gonzalo. I didn't think there was a question at <laughs> the time, sorry. Sorry. Hello. Hi. Hello. A pleasure to hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to return to your uh, question about what is working hours. Yeah. You mentioned what is working hours. Mm -hmm. I particularly work in the epistemology of time as an anthropologist. So I am interested in, in share uh, an idea with you that if one of the problem of thinking about the working hours is connected with the temporal, is connected with the linear temporality we have that mm. we are accustomed to think about hours, days, years. Mm. So when you think about multitasking, you mm. can't account what you do in a, in a superposition of labors when you are at home, but you are working with your, with your family. So I, I would like to ask you if you think we must think about a further ideas about how we account the work. Because it's not enough to think about hours. It's not enough to think about the day in 24 hours. Because we are doing multitasking. We are doing things that uh, are further than 24 if you count everything you do. Yeah. So it's, it's an idea to, to, to think about and, and if you think about this. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, this is a philosophical question about what is time? Is it linear? Is it also is it temporality? Is the other thing? Because an hour may feel very different in different situations where you're really intense. It could be really like it, it, it feels stretched. And I think there's actually scientific more evidence about the, that the temporality of time isn't, isn't the same ticking clock. And this is actually, I think, helps us to maybe even further support the idea that maybe we need artificial boundaries to protect our rest time. Because I think if you were to go into the ideas of how and what we should consider working time, especially in a knowledge economy, especially, again, with the rise of flexible working, it just, and as you say, especially once we accept the scientific proven fact that this temporality isn't very linear, isn't very steady, 
then it's almost we're lost at protecting or regulating, you know, you should only work eight hours a day. So rather, I think this is why I'm saying the right to disconnect and saying put boundaries of where you shouldn't work. It might be better. And at the moment, there is a very kind of loose touch boundary in terms of like the ILO labor convention provides periods of rest, but I don't think that's enough. I think we need to really provide a stronger boundary in terms of rest times, which is a significant period of a day, which helps us kind of address some of those issues about the kind of the amorphousness of time. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hi, thanks for the lecture. Uh, I was wondering, do you think there is a chance for a, a more goal-oriented work rather than time-oriented work? And how would that work in terms of regulation? Yeah, so thank you for that. And that's actually, sorry. Oh, oh, two more questions. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Marga and Yakit. Hi, yes. Um, I just wanted uh, to ask you if you could elaborate a bit more on the four days a uh, week. Um, proposition, because this, this is actually something that's been discussed in this mm. country. There is one left party that's trying to sort of introduce mm. this into the, into, into the agenda. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think on paper, it's, it looks great. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes all sense uh, to have a reduction of working uh, time. But then when you are confronted with highly polarized labor markets, mm. with a very high level of, of precarious employment, mm -hmm. Um, I have a sense that that might actually enhance uh, inequalities uh, yeah. in the labor market. So if you could just say a bit more about this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. See, so I think you're... Uh, in English or is, is, is better in Spanish? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think you need the device for translation. It's better. Well, Spanish is okay, but... It's, thank it's you very much. It's, <laughs> it's better because my English sounds... <laughs> To, the, to do the definition. No, no, yo quería, eh, yo agradezco la, la ponencia, ha sido muy, inter, muy interesante. Eh, yo vengo desde un sindicato, un sindicato de trabajadores, eh, con lo que me ha faltado encontrar un par de temas que quiero solo definir. Eh, y también ha sido a, a colación de la primera pregunta, y es sobre la definición del tiempo de trabajo. Bueno, realmente, eh, cuando vamos a negociar cualquier convenio, cualquier tema de ámbito laboral, Vamos a lo que son las leyes, las regulaciones y eh, el, en, hay una directiva europea, el artículo 2, que sí que define lo que es el tiempo de trabajo y lo quería compartir, que es que dice el tiempo de trabajo como el tiempo que la persona trabajadora está en su sitio de trabajo a disposición del empresario o empresaria y en el ejercicio de su actividad o de sus funciones. Esa es la definición que hay ahora mismo. Entonces, ese es un concepto que quería poner sobre la mesa, igual que la legislación española no lo define concretamente, la europea sí. Y hay otro que es el tema de la democracia. ¿Cómo puede haber una regulación justa y un reparto equitativo de la, del tiempo de trabajo si no hay democracia? Y eso solo se puede conseguir mediante la negociación entre personas trabajadoras y empresarios, que son los que organizan el tiempo. Eh, y, eso, y por último, también hay que tener muy claro también el contexto, que por supuesto no es tu ámbito no, el español, pero en España el 80% de las empresas de menos de 10 trabajadores no ofrecen posibilidad de teletrabajo, ni siquiera. Y en España las pequeñas y medianas empresas forman, eh, son gran parte del tejido empresarial y productivo de, de este país. Con lo que si no tenemos posibilidad de teletrabajar, todo lo demás tampoco se puede ejercer. Muchas gracias. One more question, if it's okay for you. Yo también hablaré en español. Eh, muchas gracias por la, por la reflexión. Creo que sitúa en el núcleo del debate un tema muy, muy importante como es el de la flexibilidad y todas las paradojas. Pero yo pongo una, sobre la mesa también un tema que ahora el compañero también decía. Eh, el porcentaje de personas que no pueden tra trabajar, o sea, los que a, llaman el desk les, eh, trabajadores, ¿no?, que no, que no trabajan en oficina y es un porcentaje importantísimo, no tienen posibilidades, no, no tienen una gran mayoría eh, flexibilidad, esa flexibilidad que otros muchos trabajadores y trabajadoras tenemos. Entonces, creo que eh, estudiando estadísticas eh, de condiciones de vida y de trabajo que se han hecho en Europa, hay, hay países donde hay un porcentaje muy importante de personas que, pueden, que tienen flexibilidad 
y países donde hay un porcentaje muy importante de personas que no tienen flexibilidad, como es el caso de nuestro país, por ejemplo. ¿no? Por tanto, ahí hay una, una paradoja que es entre los trabajadores que pueden tener flexibilidad y, lo que no, y los que no pueden tener buscan formas de poder tener esta flexibilidad. Por tanto, ahí hay, hay un debate que tenemos que abrirlo un poco más. Y el segunda, la segunda cuestión es un tema que ha salido a lo largo de estas jornadas, que es el tema de la, de la semana de cuatro días. Precisamente había una ponente que, que ponía sobre la mesa el hecho de que la jornada de cuatro días puede incrementar eh, discriminaciones de género. Y apuestan más por una reducción de la jornada de trabajo, porque el trabajo eh, no pagado, el trabajo de curas, no se hace en unos días, se hace todos los días de la semana. Entonces, eh, quien hace ese trabajo de curas necesita tener, le sería seguramente más provechoso tener menos horas de trabajo diarias. ¿no? Por tanto, ahí hay un debate también abierto que, que es importante reflexionarlo y, y escuchar todas las partes implicadas. Gracias. And to end two very quick questions. The first one is regarding uh, you were linking um, right to disconnect and productivity. Uh, if you can develop a bit more on this idea and which data we have to to ensure that. And the second is a bit more of re reflection. This, the, the last days we were, uh, we have been talking about youth, no? young people are um, big allies for the right to time. Mm -hmm. And uh, on these regards, uh, do you have uh, any, any data showing how young people react to this self-exploitation? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've uh, messed up the mic. Hola, yo también hablaré en, en castellano. Por introducir una perspectiva nueva ¿no? desde las ciudades, desde los pueblos, eh, desde la proximidad, cuando organizamos la ciudad a nivel urbanístico, a nivel de servicios, a, eh, nos encontramos también con estas dificultades eh, que aunque queremos organizar mejor la ciudad para, dar, para hacer, eh, hacerla más eh, o a usar mejor el tiempo, ¿no? o que los ciudadanos puedan eh, tener mejor calidad de vida en todos los aspectos, tenemos muchas dificultades porque cómo organizamos la ciudad en torno a los horarios laborales, a los horarios escolares, es un poco complicado ¿no? cuando, cuando lo que tú intentas es pues, eh, facilitar, ¿no? Ese, eh, conciliar, ¿no? cuando los horarios de trabajo con los horarios escolares y con los diferentes horarios que hago. Tienes ahí una complejidad añadida porque... Yo, felicitarte sobre todo por tu exposición, porque me ha encantado. Pero seguimos organizando la ciudad en torno al mundo laboral muchas veces, ¿no? Es, a esas necesidades de cubrir esa cantidad ingente de horarios que tienen los tra las personas trabajadoras, ¿no? Y es realmente complejo. No sé si conoces algunas experiencias al respecto. Y una última cosa, y es que... Sí, eh, yo, yo aquí pienso que las empresas tienen mucho que decir y mucho que hacer, no solo en cómo en, en el tiempo de trabajo, sino cómo se organiza ese trabajo. Todavía tenemos un empresariado que la mayoría organiza el, el, el trabajo o, lo, o, o las formas de trabajo en torno a un supuesto sujeto disponible, como tú bien decías. Por lo tanto, yo creo que si no cambiamos eso, difícilmente vamos a avanzar. Thank you very much. Now you have, we have a lot of questions. I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you for all these questions. I, 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 I thought half of you were asleep, but okay, that was not the case. Um, I, I, I can, so the, the gentleman in the Greek, can you just repeat your question? Because I, I, I remembered it, but then there were too many questions, so I didn't write it. Th Oh, right, yes, goal, yes, that's right, yeah. So, like, let's just go sequentially. With the goal. So, I think the whole point is, you know, going back to that time and the, the amorphousness of it, and how, I think it's just, like, the provocation is how ludicrous it is that we're still based on a very industrialized, factory-based work schedules, or, or work, notions of work and productivity, and that we need to be more goal or target-oriented in terms of measuring output, measuring kind of success or performance. 
Now the problem is, once you start doing that, it might actually lead to companies misusing it, especially when workers don't have powers, to add more work and say, well, it's just, you could do it whenever you want, but it's just almost impossible to do it within a given amount of time. Even if it's amorphous, still, we still have 24 hours, seven days a week. So, you know, only, it would be good to be goal focused only when we are able to protect workers, protect those boundary times and protect the, the right to not only time, but also for collective action as well. Um, in terms of the four-day week, or maybe I should just kind of actually go in and, and, and collect it in, in different things. So with the collect, I wasn't quite sure your, I mean, it might be um, kind of div, uh, uh, missed, missed in translation, or, or in translation not here, but translation in here. Uh, but I think it's, especially with flexible working, there is a problem with the individualization of contracts. So one of the reasons why it leads to exploitations or more exploitation is because of this individualization. And this is why a lot of trade unions were against flexible working because it fractures the, in, the work group. But actually, and, and I didn't have time to talk about this here, but what you find is countries with strong unions, strong collective bargaining, but also where their workers collectively addressing these issues do much better in providing good flexible working practices. And that is because it, you, by acting collectively, you are able to protect yourself and time better. So you're much better, if you were to have collective flexible working patterns, you're much more likely to not exploit yourself, use it in a powerful mode, and that is one of the things that I, I would like to say. So it is definitely something that um, has to be done in, in that collective matter, and, and where unions actually have to be able to even be up the, the forefront in terms of gathering people's notions of what flexibilities they want, in, in, and be able to negotiate with the employers, not as individuals, but as a collective, and providing those rights. So I think, you know, again, I work with the Trade Unions Congress in the UK a lot here, and it's especially those without voices or without power that need a lot of the flexible working. And this, this actually includes some of the questions that you were saying about how, so Spain has, is one of the worst countries in terms of flexible working. Now, it cannot be explained only through the types of industries you have here, right? Because if you look at Sweden or Denmark, it's 50% plus workers working flexibly. So why is that? It's not just because you have very, very different industries. Yes, there is a differences in that, but it's not only that, because I don't think there has been a discussion or perhaps worker power enough to really push those in, such as in Germany, where a lot of these debates have been had. Now, all workers cannot work from home, not just yet. I think in the future, you'll probably see a lot more workers being able to work from home, such as retail workers, because everything is now, you know, you know we buy things online, so we need to do things online. Even factory workers with computer-aided automated systems, you could actually do it online. So for example, a good act example of this is the American Air Force now has more drone pilots than, um, fighter jet pilots. So they've moved away from fighter jets to drone pilots who sit in an office or sit in their homes and go fight in, well, mostly the Middle East, unfortunately. But, you know, okay, put that set aside. But I think the flexible working also is not necessarily just about teleworking because there's a whole range of flexible, okay, flexi time, condensed hours, etc. And it's more about the notion of how can we make sure, make collectively, or, or through a cafeteria of options for workers, ensure that work can facilitate a, a better work-family integration, that it need not be conflictual, because when it starts conflicting, it doesn't lead to good outcomes, neither to the worker or to the company. And um, kind of related to that, I think I wanted to respond to uh, Marga's question about, and also about the gender discrimination issue. So, so four-day week, can increase gender discrimination when it's done at the company level. The reason is, if it's done at the company, individualized company level, what you'll find is that it may be those companies who employ more women who use flex, uh, four day week, which if a woman in a heterosexual relationship, if a woman works four day and the man still works in the banking sector where they are expected to work 70 hours a week, Who's going to take care of children? Who's going to pick up children? Who's going to do the housework? It's going to be the women. It's going to exacerbate 
the gender inequality patterns, the same thing that we saw from home working or flexible working. Women, if they take up flexible working in those scenarios where especially if their male partners cannot, they will end up doing more housework and childcare, and as I said, exaggerated. The inequal gender inequality patterns. Having said that, we have to think about this. I'm sorry, I just broke that. <laughs> Women are in part-time work already. So women are already working four-day weeks in majority of European countries. They are very productive. They're not being paid for it. They're not getting the promotions. What four-day weeks should be able to do is essentially, women are already working four days. We're elevating women's position into a full-time working status. At the same time, we're making men work less. When men work less, then they should be able to, or they would uh, have more time to be able to, or they'll lose the excuse not to do more housework and childcare. And this is why, to be able to get those, all the men work four days or reduce their working hours, at least not adhere to the 70 hour, crazy hour working week, and elevate women's status, this is why we need to do this at a national level, or at least at a regional level, where. It's not a certain company or not, because if you have a company who do it, it's just gonna be like, especially women with care responsibility to go to that company, and then we're gonna exaggerate the inequality patterns again and again. So it's a limitation of doing this at the company level. Um, do, 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 I don't know if I've, I, um, about, we had this, the productivity issue, a right to disconnect. So Swan and Tag et al is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a psychologist who talks about work. So, we, and I, I, mean, I mean, with all due respects to people in this room, I'm pretty sure even you right now, who are really passionate about working time and right to time, still have this notion in the back of, my, of your head, and including my head, that long hours work in the office is, is productive. That somehow, okay. <laughs> but it's like, so like, at least like, you know, um, that, to be able to kind of you know be more motivated, productive, or be you know pursue my passion into terms of social justice and working time, you have to do a little bit more, a little bit more. Actuality is like if you, again we and, and this is exactly what the Time News Initiative is about. Let's look at the science about this. The science is that when you detach mentally and physically away from work, you actually end up being more productive. You have, and I'm not going to try to explain the science behind it, but essentially. When you turn your com work computer off in your head, your, your kind of software or charger or whatever, when you're sleeping, when you are able to take time off, your brain actually in the background does a lot of that problem solving that you, you, you need to do much better than you looking at the problem all the time. So what that actually does is make you more productive in, at work, right? So this right to disconnect isn't, again, only about workers' protection. Yes, that, but it's also about managers' protection because a lot of managers, especially small businesses, may not have the capacity to be really able to introduce these policies. Whereas if you were to introduce it at the European level or the national level, what you're doing is you're encouraging managers to better use their workers and better use human resource in the way that it works best. Um, Oh yeah, and then the city planning issue about flexible. So flexible, with flexible working, it completely changes our ideas of uh, city planning, et cetera. But I think that is ways, or, or the four day week or, or, or a flexible working can actually really revolutionize the way we use our cities. For example, if we don't all have to go to work at 9 a.m. in the morning, or we don't have to go to work at all. Um, so, you know, one of the great things that happened in the UK, which, so home working has expanded tremendously in the UK because we had a horrific pandemic. We had one of the worst COVID cases, and I'm here talking to you in Spain, but we are one of the world leaders in terms of COVID deaths. But um, the, the silver lining was there's a lot of government mandated home working practices. So we were working from home de facto for a year and a half, and that was enforced by the state. What happened was, people started moving out of big cities. So there were some London, uh, Manchester, these, these ma major big cities that were really bad to live in because housing was expensive, it was polluted, it was always congested. P 
people started moving out into the cities, uh, into the, the coastal areas, the nicer and more the cheaper areas because they didn't have to commute into work. They also, a lot of people were able to better, do, so school drop-offs have changed because before, it, you know, uh, people couldn't really drop off their children because, you know, the, the moving from the to, to school to like workplace, and it was such a mess and it was always a stressful issue. That's why we had more, you know, breakfast clubs and afternoon clubs, but that has changed because parents were working from home and able to just walk close to their schools. And essentially, I think what's, and this is also by our Office for National Statistics, is that it makes people use the city differently because you're at home, you're walking much more into the closer areas, not doing that long commute into the work and back, I mean, depending on who you are, obviously. and really able to rejuvenate some of those regional areas that were, in the UK case, very deprived and needed the uplift in terms of economics. Uh, and the other thing is people were using these, not necessarily public transportation because that was due to COVID, in, you know, uh, that's a bit different, but footpaths and cycling, cycling increased a lot. So you could actually really re-envision a society where people don't do nine to five, people work, you know, live in more like dispersed area, not necessarily all congested in one area, but also, especially with the four day week, my hopes, and, and there's some empirical evidence maybe we all could share about, there are, people start making better choices. So you'll be able to use public transport, like ride, not ride in cars, use public transportation because you have more time, use uh, uh, cycling or walking a bit more and be able to not always be rushing and hurrying, which makes you use these kind of bad choices, which is, you know, eating bad food, like junk food and, and, and using cars. So, yeah, I, I kind of wobbled on for a long time. I don't know if, if there's a question that I missed. And I do uh, excuse me, we're running out I know, of we're time, running but out of time. Uh, probably later you can share with I'll be uh, the, the participants your reflections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. Um, para cerrar esta primera parte introductoria, en primer lugar queríamos excusar a la representación del Ayuntamiento de Barcelona, que por motivos de salud no han podido acompañarnos. Y ahora, para cerrar, tenemos una breve intervención del ministro de Universidades, Joan Subirats, quien también nos da la bienvenida a esta jornada. Buen día, las primeras salutaciones a, a todos y todas. Lamento no haber podido estar presente en la inauguración de esta sesión de manera presencial, pero no volia dejar de hacerlo, encara que fos de manera virtual. Es un tema que amb el cual he anat parlant diversas vegades amb, amb Marta Junqué y, y, y volia doncs, també saludar a, a Margarita León, que es la directora de, del Centro de la Universidad Internacional Mendes Pelayo, aquí en Barcelona, el Centro de la Evidentemente a la alcaldesa, la meva amiga de Colau, y también al, al, profesor, al profesor Chung de la Universidad de Kent. No, no puedo estar presente aquí, pero sí que quería posar de relleu la significación que tiene este tema en estos momentos en qualsevol de los ámbitos que miremos. No? Y que también desde el ámbito universitario nos preocupa de una manera, de una manera especial. Es obvio que, que la pandemia, como segur que se que dirá o se dirá en estas jornadas, ens ha, ens ha marcat un abans i un després i en un tema que ja portàvem temps, diguem ne discutint i, i valorant, que era la necessitat de canviar el tema dels horaris, de repensar uh, les jornades de treball, ha agafat una dimensió molt més, molt més potent, no? La mateixa, la mateixa, diguem ne canvi tecnològic ha facilitat que hi hagi, eh, diguem ne transformacions significatives també en tot el que significa, diguem ne el calendari, el calendari laboral. Creo que la palabra clau que, que presideix una mica, independientemente si el tema es escurçar las horas de trabajo cada día o escurçar los días de la semana en que treballem, el tema clau es flexibilidad, ¿no? Es decir, buscar fórmulas que permiten, digamos, que, que hi hagi més, menys horas desde el punto de vista, menys temps dedicat a, a jornadas laborales muy intensas que van, que, que van més enllà del que sería raonable y en cambio eh, intentar que estas horas siguen la, las más productivas posibles y al mateix temps que haya mucha más capacidad de, de ser productivos también en otros ámbitos 
com en els àmbits familiars, en els àmbits de, de la pròpia formació personal, cada vegada més necessària, aquesta formació al llarg de la vida, que nosaltres estem també intentant diguem-ne, promoure des de les universitats, i tot el que significa també doncs, a, a, a les lògiques diguem-ne, més familiars de la, de la cura, de l'atenció, de l'alimentació, de la, de, la, de la forma de consum, és a dir, hi ha moltíssimes derivades eh, que tenen una component molt vinculada a, la, a, les, a, la, a l'extensió, a l'excessiva extensió de les jornades laborals i que avui marquen clarament l'agenda. Hi ha experiències de tota mena a tot el món, jo crec que aquí es posaran de relleu i simplement volia, volia posar de relleu el compromís també des del Ministeri d'Universitats i des de la meva persona en concret en facilitar al màxim que aquestes, que aquestes experiències es puguin valorar i que puguem avançar en aquesta línia. Moltes gràcies. Moltes gràcies al ministro Joan Subirats. I ara, per continuar, tenim una sessió de presentació d'experiències prèvies i lecciones aprendidas en, en els intentos de regular eh, les hores de, de treball, diverses experiències tant d'Espanya com d'altres eh, ciutats i països en, en Europa. Eh, quiero invitar para ello a al escenario. Eh, tendremos un formato híbrido, presentaciones online, pero tenemos el gusto de contar eh, también con algunas personas en formato presencial. Quiero invitar al escenario a Janif Bulan, eh, que nos acompaña hoy. A Montserrat Pineda. Ignaz Glorios. Y a Will Strong. Um, yes, you can stay there. <laughs> sí. Antes de comenzar, haré una breve eh, presentación de las personas que, que nos acompañan eh, aquí. Uh, Janif Bulan es, aquí un momento. <laughs> es eh, sociólogo especializado en trabajo, empleo y usos de, del tiempo y en en regulaciones, en, en políticas del tiempo y también es eh, investigador en la Universidad de París Dauphin. Montserrat uh, Pineda es secretaria de Feminismos e Igualdad en el Departamento de Feminismos e Igualdad en el Departamento de Igualdad de la Generalitat eh, de Cataluña. Eh, Ignaz Glorios es el presidente de la Asociación Internacional para la Investigación en los Usos de, del Tiempo y Will Strong es director de investigación en eh, Autonomy, un instituto del eh, Reino Unido. Eh, las personas que nos acompañan eh, online, eh, en primer lugar el señor Ignacio Buqueras, presidente de honor de la Fundación Independiente Aroe, de la Comisión eh, Nacional para la Racionalización de los Horarios Españoles, Francesca Saxi, profesora de Políticas de, del Tiempo y es, y es asesora eh, para la ley turco y está trabajando actualmente como, como delegada en Milano en temas de movilidad, sostenibilidad y, y tiempo. Creo que no Ah, y también tendremos, eh, por último, eh, la intervención también de Joaquín Pérez Rey, que es eh, secretario de Estado para el Empleo y Economía, y Economía Social. Ahora vendré aquí a la, a la, al escenario con ellos para um, eh, comentar un poco cuáles han sido estas experiencias. Comenzaremos con la presentación de Ignacio Buqueras, que es, eh, se conectará en formato online. Sí, continúo. Vale. Eh, comenzaremos entonces con Janif Bulan, quien nos acompaña aquí, eh, para que haga una breve explicación de, 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 del tiempo de la ciudad, de lo que se 
eh, hizo en el Aubrey Second Act, entiendo. Eh, ¿Cuál fue la experiencia? ¿Cuáles fueron las lecciones aprendidas eh, en, este, en ese sentido? Eh, hay cinco minutos para cada intervención, así que si puedes dar una breve explicación sobre, sobre esta experiencia. Tienes una... Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, uh, I, uh, actually, I should say that it was a kind of paradox uh, your uh, asking of the role of this law, Aubrey law. I will try to explain the, the context. Uh, actually, since uh, the 90s, the middle of the 90s, there has been a European program. The name is EUREXTER, which is an acronym for European, European Territorial Excellence. And this, uh, 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 this uh, network has undertook to disseminate the time of the cities, Tempi della Citta methods, in Italy, which uh, were born in Italy. And uh, it is interesting to note that this program was financed, the European program, program was financed by the European Social Fund and was supported by the Public Services Employers Organization, the CEEP, and the ETUC, which is the European Trade Union Congress. I think it's very important to, 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 to have that in mind because it's uh, something coming from the... the uh, Uh, and the purpose, uh, the purpose of this uh, program was to develop the local social dialogue. How to develop, how to have a, a, a social dialogue at the local level. And uh, there has been a meeting on working time in uh, the institutes, uh, European Institute of uh, Florence in 1995. And we meet. Uh, the, the, there, is a, there has been a meeting between the leaders of this program the men were, we were monitoring this program, and three uh, researchers of different nationalities and disciplines. I mean, Sandra Bonfiglioli, which uh, was a urban planner in the Politecnico uh, of Milano, director of the urban planning uh, department of the Politecnico de of uh, Milano. Ulrich Mückenberger, who was a law You know him, he, he has uh, been made a, a contribution uh, uh, on Monday. Uh, he's a lawyer uh, on uh, social uh, labor uh, questions and myself, a sociologist. And the, the question was, okay, the local social dialogue, but what are the main objective of social local dialogue? And we decided that time should be a key uh, element for the social dialogue. And in the case of France, to come back to the case of France, uh, the case of France uh, several French local authorities were made aware of time policies following the example of Italy under the impetus of the Eurexter program, the Eurexter network. And there has been a French branch of this network, the French Social School of Territorial Excellence, which has initiated training courses integrating time issues in several uh, territories and organized several study uh, visits uh, in Italy. And several of these territories have taken part in seminars and summer school organized by Eurester Network, network between 96, 1996 and uh, 2000. And a powerful stimulus for reflection of France came from the process of implementing the 35 hours a week, which has begun in 1997, actually. And uh, the, the, there has been a question for, for, it was a question for local authorities mm -hmm. on, on, on the future uses of time, the future impacts of the new links between working time and other social, social times on mobility, on the uses of social and cultural infrastructures, of services uh, 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 infrastructure. And time schedules and opening hours were going to be shaken up by the implementation of the 35 hours a week. And all these reflection arose in the context of the discussion of the second law, Aubrey. I, I, rem I, I remind you that uh, to implement uh, the 35 hours a week, there has been two laws. One law, first law in 2007, 
uh, two, uh, in uh, uh, 97 and uh, the uh, second law in uh, uh, 2000. And uh, uh, during this time, we, we, we have begun to discuss and to publish articles, books on, on uh, pu pu uh, local time policies. And uh, Martin Aubry, who was a Ministry of Labor, as a Minister of Labor, has, not, uh, has prefaced a book, La Ville à Mille Temps, uh, time with uh, thousands of times, uh, written by Ulrich Meckenberg and myself. And she and her teams were made aware of the externalities that would be generated by the 35 hours a week. This is why, at the last, mo at the last moment, the paragraph, this paragraph, was uh, added in, uh, in the law, in the first article of the law. Uh, um, and uh, you can read uh, this, uh, this, um, this uh, uh, paragraph, but for the Spanish uh, <laughs> Catalan uh, language, I can read it. In urban areas with more than uh, 50,000 inhabitants, the chairman of the intermunicipal structure, in liaison with, where appropriate with the mayors of neighboring municipalities, promotes the harmonization of public services timetables with needs arising in particular, particular for the point of view of the reconciliation of professional life and family life, the evolution of the organization of work in the activities established on the territory of the municipality or nearby. To this end, it brings together as needed representatives of the organization of lo or local authorities managing the services concerns and puts them, where appropriate, in contact with the social partners, very important, of companies and local authorities in order to promote knowledge of the needs and facilitate the search for local adaptation capable of satisfying them. Dennis. I think it's very important to have, uh, to, to, to have this. Uh. But frankly speaking, uh, this paragraph is quite ignored by the local, the official, because this law concerns working time, a matter which does not fall within the scope of the competence of local authorities. But this law brought a form of legitimacy to Excuse me. Just one minute, Chief. Okay. Yeah, this you. law brought a form of legitimacy to time policies. The legitima and this legitimacy was reinforced by the Datar seminar, which was the Datar is a delegation uh, to the urban uh, planning and uh, an institution, governmental uh, institution in charge of territorial planning, with, which was attached to the prime minister. And this institution, launched a call for projects entitled Territories 2020, which included one on time and territories, which content, content derived from several papers we have written on time policies. And the network of training, reflection, and exchange of experience aggregated around the French School of Territorial Excellence and uh, uh, the, my institute in Paris Dauphine, uh, uh, as monitor this uh, seminar during three years. Mm. And in addition, the state secretary for the city, as well as the one dedicated to women's rights, uh, were involved in the process of uh, reflection by jointly organizing the seminar and a, pa and a parliamentar parliamentary report. And to conclude, I, 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 we, I should say that this there has been a strong support to time policies at the beginning of the 2000s in the, f in the, in the course of the law on the 35 hours a week. But this, unfortunately, has stopped uh, in 2002 when uh, the support of government has stopped in the, in, the, in the 2002 when there has been a change of government. But this is another story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Ahora nos acompañará en formato online Ignacio Buqueras, quien nos explicará los intentos que se han llevado a cabo en España para aprobar 
una ley de usos del tiempo y cuáles han sido las lecciones aprendidas eh, durante estos procesos. Segundo, que está. Podéis ir pensando las preguntas. Buenos días. Buenos días. Bueno, veo que ya estamos conectados. Sí, adelante. Eh, tiene cinco minutos para hacer esta intervención sobre los intentos que ha habido en España para impulsar leyes en usos del tiempo. Muchas gracias. Bueno, yo tengo que decir que el año que viene se cumplirá el 20 aniversario de que pusimos en marcha, pusimos en marcha a nivel nacional la Comisión Nacional para Racionalizar los Horarios Españoles. Desde el primer momento nos pusimos en contacto con el Congreso de los Diputados, especialmente también con el Senado, con UGT, con comisiones obreras, eh, con el ministro de Administraciones Públicas, en una palabra, con aquellas instituciones y entidades que consideramos que en este tema tan importante debían dar un paso al frente. Nosotros desde el primer momento solicitamos que España tuviera unos horarios similares al resto de Europa. Eh, unos horarios más humanos, unos, humanos, unos horarios más racionales que permitieran la conciliación, que permitieran la corresponsabilidad, que mejoraran la productividad, porque aquí, como hace 20 años, aún estamos en un país que en muchos aspectos es tercer mundista, que lo que se trata es largos, largas jornadas laborales con poca eficiencia y por otra parte en estos momentos que el precio de la energía se ha subido por las nubes y probablemente son más horas de aire acondicionado, de calefacción, de estar en los lugares de trabajo. ¿Eh? Una de las primeras reuniones que nosotros tuvimos fue en el Congreso de los Diputados, concretamente ¿eh? la primera que tuvimos fue el 27 de febrero del 2006. Yo me reuní, acompañado de los miembros de la Comisión Nacional, con Mario Marín, que era el presidente del Congreso de los Diputados. A la reunión asistieron los portavoces de diferentes partidos, por ejemplo, Teresa Cunillera por parte del PSOE, por parte del PP, Ana Torné, Sánchez Libre por parte de Convergencia y Unión, Margarita Uría por parte del PNV, que asistieron a la reunión. De esta reunión salió la necesidad de crear en el Congreso de los Diputados una, una podríamos decir, un grupo de trabajo importante para esta coordinación, ¿eh? para que hubiera estos horarios racionales. Hubo buenas expectativas, la prueba es que nosotros al cabo de, eh, al año siguiente tuvimos un pleno también en el Congreso de los Diputados, allí asistieron también diferentes personalidades por parte del PP, por parte del PSOE, los diferentes partidos políticos, hubo, podríamos decir, un, una idea de avanzar en este tema. Sin embargo, las cosas quedaron semiparadas porque al deseo de crear esta coordinación en el Congreso de los Diputados, hubo ciertos, podríamos decir, defectos en las formas y en los planteamientos. El único que en aquellos momentos se mojó, perdonen la palabra, fue el ministro de Administraciones Públicas, Jordi Sevilla, ¿eh? que él ¿eh? no solamente apoyó los planteamientos de la Comisión Nacional para racionalizar los horarios, sino que por otra parte intentó que los diferentes ministros en este aspecto avanzaran. Lamentablemente considero que fracasó él mismo en un acto, en un desayuno, en el Hotel Rich, públicamente dijo eh, que se había encontrado poco apoyo por los miembros de los diferentes eh, ministerios por parte de los diferentes ministros. Él, por otra parte, publicamos el libro blanco sobre el tema de los horarios en ¿eh? España, 
debe tener unos horarios europeos, ¿eh? él hizo el prólogo del libro y en su Ministerio de Administraciones Públicas hicimos la presentación del mismo que tuvo amplia repercusión mediática. ¿Eh? Tengo que indicar ¿eh? que hemos celebrado ¿eh? 84 plenos en diferentes instituciones y entidades. Las dos primeras que siempre nosotros incidimos fue UGT y Comisiones Obreras. Tengo que decir eh, que tanto el secretario general de una, Cándido Méndez, eh, como Fidalgo o la otra, teóricamente estaban receptivos a nuestros planteamientos. Lo mismo hicimos eh, con las diferentes instituciones del mundo empresarial. Eh, todo el mundo, buenas palabras, pero los hechos es que han transcurrido 20 años y España continúa no teniendo los horarios que serían apetecibles, horarios que permitirían una mejor conciliación, una mejor eh, corresponsabilidad, que España en estos momentos sea líder europeo en baja natalidad, tiene mucho que ver con nuestros horarios, ¿eh? las mismas televisiones, las televisiones públicas, hemos dicho muchas veces, ¿eh? no ayudan absolutamente nada con sus programas prime time terminando dos y media a la una de la noche y sobre todo las públicas, ¿eh? nosotros en un momento determinado logramos que Radio Televisión Española durante seis meses adelantara su prime time y terminara sobre las once y media que sería lo deseado, que es lo que ocurre en todos los demás países europeos que finalizan alrededor de las once, once y cuarto, once y media como máximo. ¿eh? Por tanto, Considero que es la gran asignatura pendiente que tiene nuestra democracia porque esto indiscutiblemente va en el buen, podríamos decir, comportamiento de las personas y son muchos los líderes políticos que no dicen que no a unos horarios más humanos, más racionales y más europeos, pero por debajo la mesa están haciendo todo lo posible para que no haya estos cambios. De esta manera dicen que España es diferente. Tenemos que terminar con ello. Considero eh, que el acto que se está celebrando hoy con fuerza eh, y con planteamientos claros y planteamientos muy razonables, tenemos que avanzar. Y en este aspecto yo haría un llamamiento no solamente a la clase política, eh, no solamente eh, a los sindicatos, a los empresarios, sino también a la sociedad civil. La sociedad civil en este tema, que a todos nos afecta en nuestra vida diaria, tiene que avanzar y tiene que decir basta con estos horarios que nos separan de Europa y que al mismo tiempo no facilitan la vida familiar, la vida laboral, la vida social, etcétera, etcétera. Muchas gracias por esta oportunidad. Muchas gracias a Ignacio Buqueras por esta eh, intervención que además nos plantea cuáles son los, los retos de futuro eh, para continuar trabajando en la regulación de los usos de, del tiempo. Ahora tenemos otra intervención online de Francesca Saxi. Eh, Welcome, Francesca. Um, I'm Fran trying to, to share my PowerPoint. If, uh, sí, I'm mientras se conecta, introduzco brevemente a, a la profesora I Francesca. Sí. Uh, I don't know how to think we have okay yeah. um, I want to, to talk uh, uh, about uh, very briefly um, about the principle the law on uh, time in uh, in Italy um, it's important to uh, to, to remember uh, 
um, that uh, uh, women were the um, protagonist of uh, the third, uh, the third uh, experiment in time uh, policies, and it was in uh, the 90s, especially at the end of the no, no, 1980s, sorry, especially at the end of 80. Um, women uh, that were women with a dual presence. That means they work in family and in public work, uh, proposed a law called Women Change Times. But unfortunately, it failed. Uh, the first important starting point for uh, urban time policies was one article of the main reform text of public uh, local administration, local, uh, law number 142 in the uh, 1990. In this period, and for this law, uh, many cities, Milan, Genoa, for Roma, Catania, Bolzano, Venice, among others, uh, began to apply time policies and set up the time offices. Um, the, since the 8th March of 2000, urban time policies have been government, sorry, why I can't, have been uh, government uh, by a national law on family care and parental leave. The, uh, the law called the Turco law from its proposal, Livia Turco is the number uh, 53. Uh, this act make, makes the definition and implementation of a territorial timetable uh, plan compulsory, and this is very important, for municipalities with more than 30,000 inhabitants. And after this date, many regions approve legislation on urban times and gave and the regions gave money uh, to the municipalities for many many uh, projects uh, but we can uh, uh, go more in um, uh, the, um, uh, the the general content of, of this uh, uh, law is to promote a new balance between work care training and relationships was composed by two parts. The first, parental leave, uh, uh, regarded for balancing inside the workplace. And the second part on times policies, regard for balances in the day, uh, the, uh, the daily, daily, daily life. Um, I don't know why I can't go on with the... the uh, Okay, okay. Um, uh, going more in the detail of the law, uh, we can say that the first part promotes the harmonization of timetables throughout the region and the municipalities in order to support equal opportunities between men and women and to promote the quality of life through the balancing of working times, relationships, parental care, training and time for oneself with people who live in the city or use it even temporarily. The second part, very important, it promotes the coordination and administration of the times and schedules of the city and the adoption by the municipalities of the territorial timetable plans. Um, the left, uh, the, uh, we can say there were uh, seven main action sectors in uh, the in the law: uh, public accessibility to services, and uh, in the uh, uh, you you can you can read some of the of the cities who works on uh, this uh, uh, topic. Uh, second was public spaces integrated design, then time banks in many, many towns and quarters, agreement or pact on mobility, very important nowadays, uh, 
after pandemia, shop opening policies, uh, school times, and uh, lastly, cultural and tourist promotion of the city. Um, on these premises, uh, um, a very high number of cities defined territorial plans of 10 tables, and many of them experimented the individual project with money gave the, uh, to them uh, by the regions. Um, but I want to finish uh, to, to say, um, to present in uh, very briefly the case study of Milan, because I think is, uh, for Italy is uh, absolutely the more important. The first time plan in Milan was written at the beginning of 1990. After this period, after this moment, for about 20 years, uh, the uh, urban time policies were forgotten, and this happened under right-wing administration. Uh, with the left administration, so this difference is, uh, uh, is important to underline, with the left administration on uh, 2011, uh, the Pisa P administration, the Times Office of the City was revitalized and many individual projects activated. But a big change happened with the pandemia. Under the direction of the prefect, that is a national official, a new territorial timetable plan board with the main public and private stakeholders for the drafting of a new timetable and a new slogan hold on. Milan changes the rhythms, Milan changes the skin. Uh, it was um, a, a draft, uh, really very important because uh, uh, it was uh, supposed to, uh, to adopt a new idea of the space, of the times, of the daily life. And three big goals were, one, dilution of the demand for private and public mobility with an impulse towards slow mobility, cycling and walkability. Two, flexibility and desynchronization of working hours with the smart working but also of the beginning and the end of public service activities, especially schools, commercial places, cultural and recreational activities. That means the hours to enter and to finish the, the work in many, many services change. Um, proximity, the, the last goal, was the idea of uh, uh, 15 min the city 15 minutes. Uh, that means uh, the proximity of services. Um, well, that's all uh, because I, I, I had really uh, a few minutes. I want to say it's very difficult to, um, uh, to uh, go on and to uh, build a, a real timetable uh, timetable plans. It happened in Bolzano now, also in Bergamo, in Pesaro, in, especially in some medium-sized um, uh, habitat cities, where uh, it's uh, easier to understand, uh, to analyze uh, what the people want, how is organized the daily life of the people, and especially women. I must remember and I conclude that time policies, urban time policies in Italy and till now, women uh, are the protagonist of uh, uh, this change. And this means it's important for everybody. If uh, one law uh, or one experiment uh, uh, is important for women, this means uh, that involves all the city, men, women, of course, but also men, child, uh, uh, elderly, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca.
después de conocer eh, el, el aprendizaje de una experiencia pionera, como lo ha sido la, la ley turco en, en Italia, que además ha mostrado la importancia de, de la transversalidad a la hora de, de impulsar iniciativas eh, como esta. Eh, ahora, para continuar en esta presentación de, de experiencias, eh, contamos con la presencia de Montserrat Pineda, secretaria de Feminismas en el Departamento de Igualdad y Feminismas de la Generalitat de Cataluña, quien se explicará también la experiencia de una otra iniciativa pionera como com la reforma horaria a Cataluña y quién también es, es la nueva visión, la nueva perspectiva uh, de las políticas de del temps a, a Cataluña. Muchas gracias. Tienes cinco minutos para la teva intervención. Sí, me puse el cronómetro para per un caso. Um... Bueno, en primer lugar, eh, agradecer a que te de, de poder compartir con con todas vosotras, ¿no? A que esta a que esta aposta que que fem com a com a govern, ¿no? Y y digo una aposta porque precisamente recullim toda la experiencia que se ha estat fent, ¿no? Des de fa moltíssims anys, ¿no? Amb els diferents governs i amb els diferents lideratges, però també la oportunitat de poder explicar quina és la la marca, ¿no? de alguna manera, que, que nosotros como, como gobierno de Cataluña volem donar. ¿no? Va a ver como la nuestra consellera ¿no? feía una reflexión sobre por qué las políticas del TEMS eh, y por qué estas políticas del TEMS ¿no? también las estén en tu mano desde esta transformación feminista. Y precisamente es el nuevo mark que, que nosotros volem eh, explicar vos. ¿no? Eh, ya casi por un minuto y, y en cara no os he dado las cuatro claves que, que os volía explicar. Era una mica más larga y a vos haré un, un resumen bastante bastan, eh, corto de, del que os volía. ¿no? Sí que creo que es muy importante ¿no? explicar vos que tenemos una larga trayectoria a Cataluña, ¿no? con, con de ella, ¿no? de impulso de estas políticas. Desde el 2007 ¿no? eh, es va a crear la Comisión de Igualdad y TEMS eh, de trabajo en el en el sí del Consejo de Relaciones Laborales de Cataluña, es el órgano de concertación que tenemos a, a Cataluña. Y yo creo que es muy, muy relevante eh, pensar ¿no? que, que ya en el 2007 estaban en, en esta línea. ¿no? De forma paralela, yo creo que no es menos importante, es va a crear la Dirección General para la Igualdad de Oportunidades en el Departamento de Trabajo, para que marca de alguna manera las dos políticas y las dos eh, lógicas ¿no? que, que desde el Gobierno eh, es va a iniciar. Y precisamente eh, el FED, ¿no? de que yo en aquel momento histórico, ¿no? en un momento del tripartit, es, es realice, ¿no? a que estas políticas nos están explicando también quién era la importancia eh, y quién era el, 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 el momento de inicio de, de las políticas. ¿no? Es ser que después hemos tenido diferentes momentos, hay iniciativas ciudadanas para la reforma horaria en el 2013, en el 2015 se va a crear el Consejo de Asesor para la reforma horaria, no voy a estar diciendo para no olvidar más res. En eh? 2017 no, se va a generar el Pacto de la Reforma Horaria, no? en el 19 el Gobierno va a crear la Oficina de Reforma Horaria, no? eh, que después ya explicaré por qué se ha transformado, no? en el 20 es va a generar un plan de vivir millón. no? En el 2020, crisis de la pandemia, ¿no? que nos hace reflexionar también quiénes son los marcos ¿no? eh, y quiénes son las políticas que, que hemos de avanzar. Y para nosotros es muy importante esta estrategia ¿no? del trabajo con Juna la Times, eh, eh, per, per, no solamente ¿no? para la nuestra participación, sino también para la posibilidad del que esté en Fenara, ¿no? Abans la, la, la Marta. Eh, antes de ella, ¿no? es un avui ens tracta de, de, de la batra, ¿no? y la posibilidad que esta taula ¿no? estigui precisamente ¿no? institucionalmente, políticamente, apostant eh, té a veure también amb, amb, amb la declaración de Barcelona de las políticas del TEMS que, que vam, a, que vam a realizar. Y ¿no? también explica ¿no? una aposta con com va a hacer Palés, ¿no? la, la consellera, pero que avui también voy a poner en evidencia, de que esta también tan transformación de por qué las políticas del TEMS las estén liderando a más que esta nueva estructura que es un departamento de igualdad y feminismo. Y te veo ahora precisamente al que somos conscientes que esta transformación es una transformación feminista, pero también es una transformación de clase. 
És una transformació que té a veure amb les quatre transformacions que el govern ha apostat, la verda, per tant, totes les polítiques de sostenibilitat són imprescindibles, no són transformacions o revolucions que han d'anar, que són paral·leles, sinó tot el contrari, si no tenen aquesta conjuntura no es pot produir. Per suposat, la transformació social que incorporo al tema de classe, o sigui, les polítiques de gènere no solament estan atravessades, és obvi que estan atravessades per la gènere, però també per la classe. Quan estem parlant de desigualtat, quan estem parlant de bretxa, quan estem parlant de pobresa, estem parlant de privilegis, estem parlant de desigualtats i estem parlant de discriminació. Per tant, necessitem que això vagi acompanyant aquesta transformació. Però, per últim, i no menys important, i jo crec que també és rellevant, és aquesta transformació democràtica que hem de fer. Perquè, ho deia la consellera, ho reprenc una altra vegada. La possibilitat que tenim de la participació, del temps de participació democràtica, és un eix fonamental. I ja no podem entendre aquesta transformació, aquesta revolució que hem de fer. Fixeu-vos que parlo de revolució. Ja no solament parlo del dret al temps, estic parlant de revolució. Ha de garantir que aquesta participació política que hem de realitzar necessita un temps i és imprescindible. I per això, aquest lideratge des del Departament. I aquesta aposta directa de generar una nova direcció general de cures, organització del temps i equitat en els treballs com a una política única, d'un únic lideratge amb diferents marcs, que després us explicaré, però una aposta directa que havíem de ser des d'aquest departament per aquesta estructura d'igualtat que ens semblava molt important. Estic dedicant molt de temps a aquesta part perquè em sembla imprescindible per poder parlar de política del temps, poder parlar de la institució perquè si no el que parlem són de les conseqüències de com generem polítiques. I la pròpia organització és la manera també d'entendre com vols fer política. I en aquest sentit, tota la trajectòria que ha fet el govern han estat explicant com enteníem les polítiques. El lideratge, per exemple, que estem realitzant amb el Departament d'Empresa i Economia, amb tots els impulsos de les noves mesures o el treball que realitzarem amb el Consell de Relacions Laborals amb algunes de les mesures que us indicaré o que després, si no tinc temps ara, em podeu preguntar i us explico, té a veure precisament amb aquest co-lideratge, amb aquesta búsqueda de nous marcs. I en aquest sentit, igual que el treball que estem fent en presidència, en funció pública, que té a veure amb aquests nous marcs d'incorporar, no com a mesures exclusives de conciliació, sinó com a mesures de transformació de la pròpia organització. Ja no estem parlant dels binomis treballadores representades pels sindicats i els marcs més empresarials o la pròpia administració com a un agent de... Un minut? El temps és un valor molt important, però sí que, en tot cas, per mi és molt rellevant aquesta lògica del treball, per exemple, que estem fent en funció pública, de canviar també el paradigma dels plans d'igualtat. Per què dic això? Perquè aquí no ha sortit com a una política de transformació, no? en l'àmbit, per exemple, laboral, i és imprescindible com, per exemple, els plans d'igualtat, ja no solament a les empreses, sinó a la pròpia administració, ha de canviar la cultura organitzativa. Ja no estic parlant exclusivament de quines són les mesures laborals, que després us puc explicar amb una mica més de temps, de racionalització del temps, d'utilització del temps, sinó la pròpia organització ha d'explicar-se a si mateixa de forma diferent, ha d'explicar-se a si mateixa com el dret del temps ha d'estar en la pròpia organització del que s'entén per igualtat. És obvi que tenim un munt de reptes i des de l'administració som molt conscients que aquests reptes tenen a veure amb com afrontem les bretxes, la pobresa, la desigualtat i la discriminació. I això solament es pot fer a través de polítiques de cures, a través de polítiques d'una millora de l'economia. I quan dic polítiques de cures, nosaltres hem apostat molt clarament amb el programa de temps i cures, perquè també hem apostat molt clarament, per exemple, amb l'avançament 
en el ámbito escolar de, de los horarios, porque también hemos apostado ¿no? de la gratuidad del 0 a 3, porque también hemos apostado a una serie de medidas que no integren con a medidas de temps y son políticas de temps porque son políticas de transformación feminista. Y yo creo que esta es la aposta que, que estén en fent como a Uber, porque es la aposta que pensé que MDC para entender que cuando estén hablando de políticas de temps en el ámbito laboral no estén hablando de la racionalización o de, o de la flexibilidad horaria, que también, sino de la concepción del que tenim a nivel global del que significa el dret al temps. Gracias. Después de conocer tres experiencias que han sido pioneras y que sin duda nos, nos ayudan a, a, a la reflexión que estamos teniendo durante esta semana, ahora eh, conoceremos qué está pasando eh, actualmente o cuáles son las perspectivas actuales para, para avanzar en, en este ámbito. La primera intervención que tenemos en este sentido es de Joaquín Pérez Rey, que es el secretario de Estado de Empleo y Economía que está conectado en este momento, quien nos explicará eh, qué está pasando en relación con, con la organización de, de, del tiempo y el mercado laboral en el caso de, de España y cuáles son las, las perspectivas de, de impulsar nuevas actuaciones en, en este sentido. Bienvenido, Joaquín. Tiene cinco minutos para tu intervención. Muchas gracias. Muy bien, pues eh, nada, muchísimas gracias. Un, un, un saludo. La, lamento mucho no, no poder estar de forma presencial. Creo que es un eh, congreso y una iniciativa verdaderamente eh, pues impresionante por la calidad de las personas eh, que intervienen y por eh, bueno, el, el nivel, el nivel de, las, de las reflexiones. Es algo eh, verdaderamente envidiable, así que qué pena no haber participado eh, presencialmente de la misma. Seguramente habrá otra ocasión. Bien, a mí me gustaría en, enfocar este este tema decisivo, yo creo que casi esta es una de las políticas más importantes a las que se puede enfrentar un país desde el punto de vista de, de, del, del tiempo de trabajo. El, el tiempo de trabajo realmente eh, suele tener una centralidad excesiva en la, en, la, en la vida de las personas, porque aunque muchas veces hablamos solo de tiempo de trabajo, no podemos perder de vista que ese mismo tiempo es el que condiciona el resto de, el resto de, de actividades eh, cotidianas de, de, de los ciudadanos. ¿no? Es decir, una, cuando uno está trabajando no puede normalmente estar conciliando, no puede estar disfrutando del ocio, no usa el transporte público eh, o eh, determina eh, otros elementos. Quiero decir con esto que el tiempo de trabajo alguna vez ha ocupado un espacio tan fuerte en las sociedades y lo sigue haciendo que determina el resto de tiempos, hasta el punto ¿no? que en algunas ocasiones, en, ya en, en, en un exceso lingüístico, se habla de todo el resto del tiempo como tiempo de no trabajo, ¿no? como eh, la, una definición en negativo que deja muy claro eh, cuál es el orden de prioridades que precisamente eh, tenemos que cambiar. Yo creo que quizá el tiempo, ese protagonismo excesivo del tiempo de trabajo es el primer elemento que hay que que hay que redefinir, ¿no? Es el primer elemento que hay que tener en cuenta. Y los, los, los tiempos, el resto del tiempo, los tiempos de las ciudades, los tiempos de la convivencia, los tiempos del ocio, deberían ganar un protagonismo por sí mismos sin necesidad de ser siempre un resto, lo que nos queda libre tras eh, empeñar una parte de nuestras vidas en, en el trabajo. Eh, quiero decir con esto que normalmente el problema de la jornada siempre se... y, y de hecho creo que lo seguimos haciendo se construye desde la cantidad y no desde la calidad. Y este es otro de los elementos a los que tendríamos que, que tender a, a, a reflexionar so, sobre él. Porque está claro que la cantidad es decisiva. El movimiento obrero, básicamente, en sí mismo, se ha definido por, desde sus orígenes hasta ahora por defender siempre la limitación de la jornada pero quizá hay que empezar a poner el acento en los elementos que tienen que ver más con la calidad de esa jornada, con, con su distribución. Yo creo que eh, en nuestro país, en primer lugar, antes de nada, más allá de cuál es el tiempo máximo de trabajo y su aplicación en la ley y en la negociación colectiva, tenemos eh, problemas previos, que es los que 
desde el Ministerio estamos, en primer lugar, determinados a, a combatir. ¿Cuáles son esos problemas premios? Bueno, pues en España hay mucho trabajo extraordinario, se hacen muchas horas extraordinarias, lamentablemente. Es decir, que la referencia del máximo de la jornada muchas veces se excede eh, reiteradamente. Casi un 5%, más de un 5% de los asalariados hacen horas extraordinarias de manera habitual. En este país se hacen casi 6 millones y medio de horas extraordinarias al año y la mitad de ellas no se retribuyen en dinero, sino que buscan eh, soluciones alternativas con la distribución del tiempo. Quiero decir con eso que en, en España estamos primero en un elemento de excesos de jornada o de infradeclaración de jornadas. ¿no? Yo creo que este es el primer elemento que tenemos que tener en cuenta. Más allá de las reformas legislativas a las que ahora me referiré, lo cierto es que lo primero que tendríamos que hacer es situar el tiempo de trabajo en una esfera civilizatoria y de cumplimiento de la norma. Ya sabéis que la inspección de trabajo, precisamente en, en, a finales de septiembre, ha enviado un número importantísimo de cartas a aquellas empresas en las que sospechamos que se pueden estar dando jornadas por encima de las declaradas. Ya sabéis también que una de las iniciativas del Ministerio ha sido precisamente poner en circulación un algoritmo, una fórmula algorítmica al servicio de eh, detectar en qué empresas la gente puede estar trabajando más allá de lo que se declara. ¿no? El algoritmo, el famoso algoritmo MAX, que eh, va destinado precisamente a facilitar el trabajo de las inspectoras e inspectores a la hora de comprobar el cumplimiento del tiempo normativo. Y luego tenemos, naturalmente, toda una serie de problemas que tienen que ver con el trabajo a tiempo parcial. Como fórmula, que normalmente siempre se ha ensayado como una oportunidad de vincular la vida eh, eh, personal y, y la vida de los cuidados y la vida de las familias con el trabajo, pero que, sin embargo, en nuestro país, desafortunadamente, muchas veces acaba en trabajo a tiempo parcial no deseado que conduce a situaciones de precariedad. Como bien sabéis, todos estos elementos han, 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 han sido, están siendo vigilados por la Inspección de Trabajo y Seguridad Social y, naturalmente, han sido objeto de las reformas legislativas que hemos emprendido desde el Ministerio, especialmente la reforma laboral, y aún nos quedan cosas por hacer. Yo creo que otra enorme oportunidad es transponer al ordenamiento español las directivas tanto de permiso parental como de condiciones de trabajo transparentes y fiables, que en definitiva las dos inciden en dos elementos decisivos que, el, que hay que procurar en el trabajo. La posibilidad de conciliación sin esfuerzos que obliguen a aquellos que tienen que conciliar realmente a abandonar sus carreras profesionales, este es un elemento capital, posibilidades de conciliación flexibles, adaptadas a las necesidades. No se trata, insisto aquí también una vez tanto, de cuánto, sino del cómo, de dónde poder colocar los tiempos de cuidados, dónde poder colocar los tiempos de convivencia familiar, los tiempos de ocio, adaptarlos a las necesidades personales de los trabajadores y las trabajadoras, huyendo de la fórmula eh, que hasta ahora, con la que hasta ahora se ha regulado la jornada de trabajo, que realmente solo desde la perspectiva empresarial, que desde luego no digo que sea importante, pero esa unilateralidad en la reflexión sobre la jornada de trabajo, de la jornada de trabajo solo cuando es útil a la producción empresarial, creo que tiene que ser superada desde una gestión que también tenga en cuenta los intereses de los trabajadores y la necesidad, la necesidad de disfrutar los propios trabajadores de una distribución irregular de su jornada para poder colocar el tiempo de cuidados, el tiempo de ocio, el tiempo de vida en definitiva en aquellos momentos que sean más, más provechosos. Por lo tanto, la directiva de permisos parentales y condiciones de trabajo transparentes y fiables, yo creo que son dos hitos normativos en los que el Ministerio está empeñado y que eh, estamos esperanzados en poder sacar cuanto antes a la legislación española para ganar en esta riqueza en la distribución del tiempo de trabajo. Pero yo creo que hay que dar un paso más, un paso eh, más ambicioso, más incluso, si me atrevería a decir, sofisticado. Y para esto, los organizadores y las organizadoras de este Congreso son, defini son definitivos, son claves. Hasta tal punto que, bueno, como eh, bien conocen, el Ministerio de Trabajo ha contado con, con, la, con la, el asesoramiento de, 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 la, de, la, de la iniciativa Time Use Week para eh, precisamente 
informar sobre lo que debe ser un granito normativo en nuestro país, no solo un granito en, 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 en el trabajo, en las relaciones laborales, sino un hito, un hito social, que es una ley de usos del tiempo. La ley de usos del tiempo, que es uno de los compromisos del Gobierno de coalición y es uno de los compromisos adquirido también por la vicepresidenta segunda del Gobierno, yo creo que es el gran modelo de empezar a usar y reflexionar el tiempo desde la racionalidad, desde la adaptación a la vida, desde la adaptación a, a, a los ritmos de las ciudades, a los ritmos de los cuidados, a los ritmos de la vida. Yo creo que este es ese, ese gran hito normativo en el que estamos ahora empeñados y que tiene, una gran, tiene a mi juicio, una gran, una gran ventaja, que es, volviendo al inicio de mi intervención, precisamente superar esa idea de que todo el tiempo es tiempo de trabajo y el resto es lo que eh, la gente puede aprovechar para hacer cosas distintas de trabajar. Yo creo que hay que superar esa centralidad, hay que establecer una fórmula coordinada entre todos los tiempos que, eh, de alguna manera, eh, tenemos necesidad de, 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 de llevar a cabo, los tiempos, insisto, eh, de, de, del ocio, los tiempos dedicados al cuidado y otra serie de ritmos. Y esto solo se puede hacer desde una perspectiva amplia y multidisciplinar. Realmente, una ley de usos del tiempo, y enlazo con lo que decía el ministro Subirat al inicio de esta jornada, es una ley para poder vivir mejor. Esta yo creo que es el, 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 el gran reto. ¿no? Yo creo que hemos pecado durante mucho tiempo de vivir encadenados durante muchas horas al trabajo y esto no solo ha resultado perfectamente inútil para la productividad de nuestras empresas o incluso para la competitividad de las mismas, que no ha producido ningún efecto real en su capacidad de innovación y de gestión, sino que ha provocado y provoca pues, mucho sufrimiento, provoca decisiones personales muchas veces eh, vinculadas al trabajo, pero que son decisivas en la vida de las personas. Es decir, cuando uno piensa que muchos de nuestros... Eh, eh, que, que muestra, no, muchos de los ciudadanos en Joaquín. este país toman decisiones tan relevantes como tener o no hijos o vivir en un sitio o en otro exclusivamente con una finalidad laboral en, 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 en mente, pues esto demuestra que eh, esa perspectiva no, no puede continuar mucho tiempo y que las decisiones vitales tienen que ser decisiones emancipadas del trabajo, porque precisamente eso es lo que garantiza una sociedad democrática y una plena ciudadanía. Una plena ciudadanía que se expresa en el trabajo, pero que tiene que también eh, expresarse fuera del mismo. Y para eso necesitamos abordar la jornada y el resto de tiempos desde una perspectiva novedosa, mucho más útil, mucho más razonable, mucho más ciudadana y que, en definitiva, nos impulse a una mejor convivencia, mucho más feliz y satisfactoria que aquella que se basa en el sufrimiento de los excesos de trabajo, los tiempos modernos y las decisiones siempre condicionadas por el despacho y la oficina y no por cómo cree que uno puede realizar mejor su vida de manera emancipada, libre e igual. Y yo lo, lo dejaría aquí eh, para no abusar más del, del tiempo, del tie nunca mejor dicho, de, del, tie del tiempo asignado, volviendo a reiterar mi absoluto agradecimiento a las organizadoras y organizadores del acto y, bueno, desde el Ministerio de Trabajo quedamos, como podría ser de otra manera, muy atentos a las conclusiones que aquí se adopten y os deseo pues, mucho, mucho éxito en esta iniciativa. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, Joaquín. Ahora contamos con la presencia de Ignaz Glorioj, quien es el... Eh, presidente de la Asociación Internacional para la Investigación de Usos de, de Tiempo. Ah, perfecto. Sí. I, have a, I have a presentation, so... Oh, yeah, it's over Thank there. you. You so, have also five minutes for okay, your presentation. Okay, I hope to... Thank you. <laughs> Very quick. Um, well, let me start by, by saying that if social scientists from the 60s or, or journalists from the 60s would be very surprised to, to, to hear the discussions we, hear, we have here today because 
In fact, the society is very different than the one they predicted. What they predicted was an area with too much leisure. There was really a, a, a moral panic in the 60s. These are some of the titles of uh, Life magazine, 1964. The emptiness of too much leisure. Automation and shrinking working week brings a real threat to all of us. So they really feared that people would have nothing to do and would be really, well, uh, well, the emptiness of too much leisure. In fact, much earlier already, uh, Keynes predicted that, and he said, well, there's no society. Um, well, we, we should be very careful. We should be prepared to the age of leisure and abundance. With, so we should fear that. It, it, so, and today we, we are just, uh, well, the idea, of course, was uh, productivity is going up. And here you see the figures for the European countries. I will not go into that, but in, in 70 years, it increased with a factor seven to uh, six. So the idea was much more productivity. Well, working hours were going down. And in fact, that's what's happening. Um, here you see the figures from the last 150 years. It decreased with 50%. So if you look, this, these are Belgian figures for the, from 1956 to 2012. Well, it's, we, 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 it decreased from 2,000 hours a year to, to less than 1,500. So in the 50s, we had a six-day uh, work week, longer working hours during the day, much uh, uh, less uh, holidays. So if you look, I have here a, t a time use survey from the 50s in Flanders, among working time men, laborers and employees. If you look at their work week, including commuting, well, working uh, married laborers worked 50 hours and a half, including commuting. Employees were privilege, they only worked 54 hours. If you compare it with the last time use uh, surveys we did in Flanders, and we compare cohabiting full-time employed men of about the same age, well, they work about 17 hours to 12, half, uh, 12 and, and a half hours less. So, it's a little bit surprising that we are discussing long working hours today. But of course, other things happened in the last 50 years. And one of the main things that changed, of course, was the participation of women in the labor market. If you look, these are figures for, for Belgium again. Well, in 53, 30%, the activity rate among women in Belgium was 30%. And it was mainly young women, uh, 14, 16, 20, 25 years, Mothers stopped working. Well, most married women stopped working for the rest of their life. If you look at the activity rate in 21, well, 71% of the women are employed. So we should put that in the picture. And if we compare working hours of the 50s to the ones today, we should bring women in because, well, we changed from a breadwinner's family to a double earning family. So if we look again at, at the time use survey of 2013 and we bring cohabiting women in from the same age group, so we see that young families today in Flanders bring in 70 hours a week in the labor market, which is more than the 50s, which is just the opposite of what was predicted. We are we, we are more active in the labor market as a family. And what is, 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 is what I would point to here too is that in these young families, let's say, well, still men have a full-time job and women 30 hours. Well, I don't know if I have the time just to briefly show, um, well, these are women and men and women from 80 to 75 years old, where you can clearly see the division of work. I will not go to the to details, maybe later in the discussion, but unpaid work among men. Well, uh, if you look at the total workload, it's more or less the same, but the division of work is still very traditionally. Um, I will leave this one. And here we see, 
what was already discussed by, by, by you. Well, in fact, we see that part-time uh, part work among men is, is very, very, very small. And it's mainly older men who are at the end of their career and not to, to combine it with, with household work and childcare. Uh, well, well we, are, we are going to 50% of the women labor force working part-time. So just as you, you pointed to the figure that is there. So um, the demand for a shorter work week is reasonable. Um, if you look at it this way, 30 work hour week would be reasonable. We would still provide more working time than in the 50s to, 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 a, to, to a couple with two people working 30 hours would still be 60 hours a week, which is more than in the 50s. Uh, and, and, and so it, it, it maybe should be uh, uh, also um, 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 uh, improve the, the traditional division of work inside the family, although I'm less optimistic than you are. We did a time you study and, and during COVID when the couple was at home and still the division of work and childcare was still very traditional. Also, the leisure time was not equal at that time. So I'm less uh, optimistic about that in the short term, maybe in the long run it would. I could say something about the 30 hours a week uh, experiment that a, a feminist organization did in Belgium, but maybe I should leave that for the discussion if we can come back to that. Um, otherwise, I probably will be too long. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right on time. Y ahora, para finalizar, tenemos una última intervención de Will Strong, uh, Director of Research at Autonomy. Um, he's going to explain the report about working hours elaborated by Autonomy. Thank you very much, Will. Up, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hi everyone, thank you for thank having you. me. Thanks for organizing it. Thanks, Hedrung, for the keynote. And thanks particularly for the last presentation. That was very interesting. I'll try and speak slowly for the translators. I'm a very fast speaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I come from Autonomy. We're a research institute or a think tank based in London, although we have employees um, ac also across the globe. Um, we're a not-for-profit um, and we have various research streams. We work on the future of care work, aging populations, technology, basic income, but the flagship policy area is the four-day week or shorter working weeks. We prefer to talk about shorter working weeks. Um, reductions in working time can be taken in various ways. Um, I would say, and I'm proud to say that it's, that I think we're one of the organizations that has put out the, some of the, like, more research on this than others to some extent. We've put out about 16 different reports over the last three years. The environmental case for a shorter working week, the gender equality case for a shorter working week, the right to disconnect, all, all sorts. Um, all of the research is available on our website. Please go have a look if you're interested. I thought I might talk about some of the initiatives that we've been involved in, which can teach us different things about working time and working time reduction. One of our first projects was with the Valencian government in, on the east coast of Spain. Um, helping design their strategy for the future of work. So if you, the, the document's available online in Spanish, uh, Valencian, and, and in English. And that was really a, a how to, as a municipality, how as a, how as a region we can move to shorter working hours. Um, and there was a, there's a particular scheme there, which I'm happy to say is now being rolled out in the region. They've recruited a number of companies for a certain set of pilots, and I would, I'm going to follow that with interest, as well as the, um, the Spanish trial at a national level, which I believe there was some communication between the two. We also work with trade unions, and I think the point earlier is very, very important that ultimately, if you look at the history of working time reduction um, and look at the, the initiatives that are really powerful today, they, they have to be in involving trade unions in some sense. In Scotland, where the conversation around working time is the most developed in the UK, there is a trade union called the PCS Scotland Trade Union. They work in the civil service, in the public sector, and they're campaigning for a 30-hour working week in, in across the civil service, Scottish government, marine, forestry, all sorts of different departments. 
that conversation is really picking up, and we did some work with them on talking to their to workers, focus groups, polling, interviews, workshops around the benefits. And it's a it's a it's a female dominated workforce. They they expressed a lot of concerns around. Um, uh, exhaustion, burnout, a lot of them have caring responsibilities and they thought a shorter working week would really help them in that area. So that's, that's a particular um, uh, example to keep an eye on. We also published the results of the Iceland study, which some of you may have read from last year. The, the public sector in Iceland over a five-year period ran a, a pilot of a reduction of working hours, about five hours. Um, it was a huge success. It was led by trade unions in the public sector. It showed that actually the public sector is perhaps not the hardest and most difficult and out of reach area to try and do work in time reduction. In fact, uh, we, we believe through some of our research uh, and also this Iceland case study that actually the public sector could lead on this. As an employer, the government, the state could shift a huge chunk of the labor market to shorter working hours and set new standards across the private sector as well. So I think it could be a market shaper as well as, as, well as just a, a kind of good example of good employment. So the Iceland, Scotland, and Valencia examples, I think, are, are really kind of um, the leading examples in this. And I think it's an important point that different sectors speak to different needs. And I think actually the strategy for different sectors obviously has to be different. Care, education, hospital, um, care, education, um, other elements of the uh, health, like health, for example. Those, diff those sectors, you simply can't reduce the working week and increase productivity because that's not how those kinds of work work. So in those cases, you will need to increase employment in general. That's not necessarily a bad thing. There are other sectors where you can actually have uh, working time reductions, as we've seen, and they can lead the way in some sense, give good examples. But that's not the whole um, labor market. We know that. I don't think that we should uh, argue against or, 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 or kind of... Um, devalue working time reduction just because some sectors are harder than others. That means that we need to work harder, I think, in order to make sure that we bring all sectors with us, men, women, all different kinds of work as well. So I think that's, that's something that we need to recognize, and, I, and I'm happy that governments around Europe are starting to think about this seriously, and that will take some serious thought. Okay, um, I'll, f I'll end with, with what we're doing in the UK. So as well as producing research, we also have a consultancy. So we help firms. It started because firms were coming to us and saying, how do we run four-day weeks in our organization? And so we help firms do that. We run pilots of six months, four-day weeks, shorter working weeks. It depends. Sometimes it's shorter days, sometimes it's shorter weeks. Um, and we're co-running with other organizations and universities. We're co-running the world's largest private sector trial, 70 companies, roughly 7-0. Um, for six months, we're about halfway through. Um, very positive results so far. Those results will be published in January, February, so we'll get some really robust results. We're asking questions around household work, around um, the distribution of tasks in the home. We're asking questions around what do they do with their spare time, these, these employees, and so on. There's about 2,000 employees, I believe. And we're going to be running more trials like this. Um, and I, I want to make it clear that pilots by themselves don't change the world, but they are very useful to, to show examples and, and give a precedent and show how people are doing this. When I started five years ago, we'd point to some care home in Sweden where they, would, they had done short, shorter working weeks. That was pretty much the only example there was. Now there are many, many examples. And in our trial, we have hospitality, we have a fish and chip shop, we have uh, a, a care home, we have uh, manufacturing, we have all sorts of industries. So I think it's important to build the case. Okay, I think I'll finish. I would like to say mm -hmm. uh, the UK campaign, which is, not, which is not autonomy. Autonomy is a research and policy organization, but the campaign is very strong at the moment. I would le recommend looking them up. The, com the conversation in the UK is very strong right now. Like the culturally, it's, you know, I was in a restaurant the other day and someone was talking about the trial, for example. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it shows the value of campaigning and working with trade unions. The trade union conversation needs to improve a lot more in terms of like we need to, we're working with them, we need to make sure that that becomes a real um, concentration point for campaigns. And finally, I'd like to say there's lots of people in the room who unfortunately I can't meet because I have to leave, but I would like to, we as an organization work with all sorts of organizations, trade unions, campaign groups, and so on, and we'd love to work with people who are in this space. Um, we have a lot of uh, economic quant capacity, a lot of research capacity, and we'd love to work with you to help push this conversation in Spain and elsewhere. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will. Um, ahora tenemos un breve espacio para eh, preguntas. Os pediría ser muy rápidos y concisos en la elaboración de, de las preguntas y comentarios que podáis tener para, 
para las personas. Eh, tenemos una primera aquí y luego Sensi también tiene una pregunta. Ok, I will try to be fast. Um, this is a, a question, I think it would be um, for you, um, Will. Um, you mentioned the future of work and uh, it, it's been discussed all this morning about yeah, working time and work time reduction. But I'm um, uh, yeah, just wondering if are we questioning the type of works we do? Like, um, yeah, it's, it's just uh, sounding that uh, it's just for the sake of working still, um, but not really the um, just getting things done and not like if these things are useful for living in general. This will be my question. Like Thank you. If, if in, uh, in the future of work, in your proposal, it's considered uh, the type of jobs or works that are being done and not only the quantity of hours. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. We'll um, recogeremos un par de preguntas más. Uh, Elisa y luego Cenci Domínguez. No. Yes, my, my question is for Ignaz Glorio. Uh, but maybe other speakers. Um, why do you think the, the four-day week is a more, um, more successful idea in comparison with the 30-hour uh, labor week that you have mentioned? And because this has more positive impact, uh, I think, a 30-day hour week in our um, daily life and to combine um, this work-life balance. Uh, but it seems that in the agenda uh, and has more power the, <laughs> the other idea. Thank you. Sí, tenemos otra pregunta aquí en la segunda fila. Sí. Y en la primera también. Yo dos, dos preguntas, una general y otra le aquí al compañero. La primera, has hablado todo el tiempo de reducción de jornadas, has hablado de otra organización del tiempo, trabajar menos horas, pero hemos hablado de salarios, ¿no? Porque, claro, eh, 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 aquí, desde la perspectiva empresarial de aquí, si tuviéramos que plantear reducir jornada, nos plantearían reducir horario, ¿no? Eh, lo digo, sal, perdón, salarios. Por lo tanto, no sé cómo se ha solventado ese problema en las experiencias que habéis tenido en las empresas. Si, ha sido capaz, si, hemos sido, si han sido capaces de reducir eh, las horas de trabajo y eso ha significado mantener los salarios o una reducción proporcional. Lo digo porque es un tema que, que tiene que estar sobre la mesa y que se debe abordar. Y luego uno en general, porque todo el rato o ha planeado, o a mí me ha dado esa sensación de ha planeado en toda la jornada, Uh, como si la organización del tiempo eh, fuera más femenina. O sea, es, estos cambios. Uh, a mí me preocupa que, que, que estemos hablando de mejorar la organización del tiempo, la organización del tiempo del trabajo, de las jornadas parciales, de la jornada reducida, para solventar un problema que tenemos solo las mujeres, sino un problema que es social y que en ningún caso tienen que ver solo con las mujeres, sino con las, sino con las personas. Lo digo porque ya nos pasa con algunos algoritmos que precisamente los datos o los que se basan son absolutamente discriminación, discriminatorios o sesgados por género. Entonces, sí, sí que a nivel de investigación son temas que personalmente me preocupa. Y, y una última cosa y es... Eh, cuando hablamos de políticas del tiempo, sobre todo, como ha hablado la, la compañera Monse, también hay que invertir y, y evidentemente requiere inversión económica. No se pueden hacer cambios si no van acompañados y dotados de un presupuesto económico porque evidentemente es absolutamente necesario si no nos quedaremos en, en el titular y no en el fondo. Muchas gracias, Lenzi. No sé si había otra pregunta aquí en la primera fila. ¿No? Emi, ¿tú tenías preguntas? ¿Ah? ¿No? Vale. Y eh, tenemos una pregunta que nos han compartido, que es para Montserrat Pineda. Uh, si pudieras detallar las medidas en el ámbito laboral impulsadas a, a Cataluña por una organización de, del temps de, de, de trabajo. Eh, Comencemos con las respuestas. Uy. Una... Sí, una pregunta también para Montserrat Pineda. Ah, perdona, no tenía. Si 
si hay, qué, qué indicadores estáis utilizando con esto para la salud mental, ¿no? ¿Cómo está afectando inclusive las bajas laborales por salud mental en los horarios? Gracias. Gracias. Okay. Well. Existing and future conditions, right? And that will mean, for example, across the board, we have aging populations. There'll be a lot more caring roles. We know that for sure. But it's not good enough, I don't think, to say we need a caring economy. The truth, we, we do need a caring economy, but the truth is that most care work is really badly paid and it's precarious and so on. So we need caring. There, there will need to be caring jobs that need to be uh, uh, well remunerated and the work of it needs to be distributed, whether it's informal care or, pa or paid care, there's going to be a lot of it. So I think we need to be aware of that conversation that we don't just say care work is good work. Well, actually, the conditions aren't actually that good right now. We need to really raise them. And also low carbon work, basically. They, we need to have, we, like, I think it's important to evaluate jobs, not because their jobs, any jobs are good job, but really the function of the job, the purpose, the conditions, and the experience of workers, basically. So I don't think we should necessarily prescribe what kinds of roles, apart from we need to be sustainable and obviously probably need to care for people because we have a huge aging population um, emerging. But also, you know, it's important that actually there's a lot of autonomy, small a, uh, in, in determining the kind of work that we do, and at the moment we don't have that. So I would say not to prescribe anything, but ultimately sustainable and, 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 and sustainable care work. Uh, final, and finally, the other question was on wages. Yes, I think it's, um, it, for us, a shorter working week is 32 hours or less. Obviously, shorter can be, can be slightly more, but for us, a four-day week, for example, is 32 hours spread in various ways, flexibly. It could be five days, short days, blah, blah. But it, wages have to stay the same as they were. So, so it's not about compressing the same amount of hours, and it's not about cutting wages. That, that's, the, that's the only definition. Otherwise, we're just talking about part-time work. And so, so, so I think that's, that's incredibly important. And, at, and there's two ways that firms that we work with have done shorter, have, have made shorter working weeks work for part-time workers. Either they reduce the working time by the same percentage as full-time workers, so like a 20% reduction of their time, or they raise wages to, um, they, we raise wages proportionally. So as Heijing was saying before, many, um, many women, for example, go down to part-time work because they have caring responsibilities, but employers should ask themselves, are they really doing is their output really less when actually uh, all you're doing is cutting their wages? So in many cases, firms we work with have raised wages to make sure that they are, they are still benefiting from the shorter working week, even if they're, earn, even if they're working three days or two days. And at Autonomy, for example, every part-time, we work four days a week, but every part-time worker gets 25% gets 25 extra each week because if, to make sure they benefit from the four-day week policy, basically. Uh, and finally, four-day week is probably more popular because it's a good slogan. Shorter working weeks are a bit of a mouthful. So, so when, when there's four-day week campaigns, boom, 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 I genuinely, th I genuinely think it's a better campaign slogan, but unfortunately, it does get us, every time I talk, we always have conversations about maybe we shouldn't be so rigid about four-day weeks. And it's absolutely true, we shouldn't be so rigid, but it's just a good slogan that campaigns have picked up. Thank you very much. Really. I think I actually have to run. So thanks, everyone. Good to see you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intervention. Nath, you have a question from Lisa, I think. Yeah. Question, it was on one of my slides, so it gave me the opportunity to tell something about the experiment um, we studied in Belgium. There was a, a group, a, 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 a women's organization, um, working about 60 women and one man. So, and they decided uh, to go over to, to a 30-hour week for a full year, fully paid. So in 2019, they went to a 30-hour week. We studied them in 2018. We did a time you study in March and October. Uh, also did interviews, focus groups, studied them during the experiment, 2019, in March and October again, and then afterwards, but then unfortunately, COVID came and it was a little bit disturbed, uh, but still we had the pre, 
uh, experimental uh, time use surveys and the experimental time use surveys to see what's happening. And um, unfortunately, it's only women. Uh, so this is a limitation, of course, of the study. But we expected, just as, as was, was told, we expected that these women would opt. They were free to choose. The, the only thing was 30 hours a week, not too much overtime to, 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 to spare for, for holidays or something. So there were limitations. But they could work four days a week. They could uh, work five days a week, even six days a week, shorter days. So we expected, as, as was expected by uh, uh, Hyung, um, that the, most of the women with children would choose for shorter days to be earlier at home to do some homework. But the opposite was true. More than 80% choose for a free day and a four-day week. So they choose for the Wednesday, when children are at home in the afternoon in Belgium, or the Friday to prepare the weekend to have a three-day uh, weekend. So in fact, that would be four days work, three days weekend. Um, choices depended a little bit on the household uh, composition, on work circumstances, choices of other colleagues you work with. So to coordinate with, with, with other colleagues at work. Um, the availability of others in the family, of course, the partner uh, to, to see. But in general, people choose for a four-day work week and work uh, eight, uh, no, less than eight, seven and a half hours um, during four days. So what happened with this experiment, maybe just uh, very briefly. So the idea was we, uh, we only do it one year because it costs some money, of course. Then COVID came. In March, they decided to go back to the 30-hour week during COVID. Then after COVID, they decided to permanently go to 30-hour work week. So now the whole organization worked 32 hours. But it was very well prepared. Also, the working time was very well prepared. They, they, they studied how to organize working time so that there would be no more pressure at work, so that it would be not to do the same work in a shorter time. So they decided to cut some things that were not so effective and things like that. So it's a very nice experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I'll give the word to Montserrat Pineda to respond to the questions. Eh, yo primer faig una reflexió sobre el, sobre el que deies amb, amb el tema de les, de les dones. No? Jo crec que és molt important diferenciar no? quin és l'impacte no? de, de determinades mesures econòmiques, laborals no? i de garantia del temps. Eh, I una altra cosa és eh, que estem referint-nos exclusivament a les dones. Evidentment, jo, jo el que estic plantejant és corregir aquestes situacions de desigualtats i discriminacions. No? I si cal, i ho dic així superclarament, eh? si cal fer actuacions eh, de, de discriminació positiva, les hem de fer. Vull dir, és que crec que hem de posar en evidència que estem obligades a fer-les. Vull dir que ja no estem en un moment de seguir no, parlant de, de mesures eh, generalistes, no? tenim que anar realment a mesures que siguin efectives per acabar amb aquesta desigualtat i discriminació. Sé que no ho deies en aquest sentit, però crec que també està bé posar-ho en evidència, i per això també parlava eh, a nivell més de, de macro. No? Eh, I aprofito precisament, i començo per, per el que comentava el, el company ara, amb el tema de les 32, els 4, no? perquè té a veure precisament amb algunes reflexions que estem fent, no solament amb la Direcció General de Cures, una sessió de temps i equitat en el treball, sinó també amb funció pública i amb el Departament d'Economia i Empresa, que és com eh, qui és el responsable final d'aquest canvi, d'aquest canvi cultural què hem de fer? Solament les empreses? Uh, solament les administracions? Solament la ciutadania? Jo crec que va molt més enllà. No? I, I precisament quan he posat exemple, no? fixeu-vos que he posat un dels exemples quan he par... I, i la taula, no? estem parlant de, de l'àmbit laboral, he parlat de l'escola, he parlat de, dels centres educatius i de les millores que hem de fer. Precisament per poder parlar de que totes aquestes mesures que hem de garantir com a, com a governs en, en aquest sentit, no? impulsar perquè es puguin realitzar les empreses, tenen que ser mesures transversals, tenen que ser realment mesures que siguem capaces de poder portar a la pràctica en tots els, els, eh, eh, en, en tots els agents. No? 
Hi ha fissures, i dic fissures, en aquest nivell més d'investigació, de pilots, que és, insisteixo, com deia abans, què passa amb la gent que està també treballant, que és la gran majoria que està treballant amb els marges. Què passa amb les persones? No tinc totes les solucions, si no vindria a explicar que estem... Estic plantejant també algunes de les qüestions. Què passa, per exemple, amb les petites empreses i els autònoms i les autònomes? O sigui, què passa amb la garantia del temps? Perquè és un lloc on aquestes situacions es donen amb més impacte i també té més impacte. Després parlaré amb el tema de salut mental. Però són qüestions que hem de garantir i que i que espero que realment aquesta llei que s'està plantejant també tingui molt present aquests marcs. Però també tot el tema dels torns, o sigui, com es garanteix amb les 32 i les 35 hores tot el tema dels torns, que és un tema molt complex, i fins i tot nosaltres en la pròpia administració estem buscant clarament un debat primer intern sobre sobre Mossos, sobre tot el sistema sanitari. Penseu en el sistema sanitari, no solament pensem en les fàbriques, pensem en tota aquesta estructura que requereix efectivament parlar sobre com aquestes mesures impactaran. Nosaltres en aquest any, en el maig d'aquest any, dintre de l'administració de la Generalitat i en conjunt amb les organitzacions sindicals, hem introduït 11 mesures per afavorir la conciliació de la vida laboral. Si em permeteu, vaig molt ràpida, però les assenyalo perquè són exemples exclusivament, però dic exemples d'algunes qüestions que poden ser interessants per totes, que és el tema de la flexibilitat horària. Ja els empleats i empleades públiques ja tenien aquesta flexibilitat, però hem augmentat en 30 minuts la part de permanència obligatòria de l'horari. Creiem que era una mesura que és una immersió que té un gran impacte. El gaudiment a temps parcials dels permisos de naixement per la mare biològica, el permís d'adopció, permís de guarda i permís de protecció i nitó, diferents a la mare biològica per al naixement, guarda i adopció d'un fill i d'una filla. Són mesures que es plantegen de transformació i que crec que són molt importants. Permís d'exàmens prenatals, tècniques de preparació al part, tràmits administratius per l'adopció i l'acunyament. Són mesures que tenen un impacte en la vida i que de vegades han estat com de segon ordre. I el que nosaltres, quan estic posant en aquesta taula, és precisament perquè pensem que són de primer ordre i les hem d'abordar d'aquesta. La compactació de la reducció de les jornades per motius de conciliació criteris interpretatius sobre l'horari de treball en relació a l'absència i a la consulta mèdica. És un tema que, sobretot a l'administració pública, és molt rellevant. Els criteris interpretatius sobre el còmput inicial per un gaudiment de permís d'especialització, equiparació dels graus d'afinitat i consanguinitat per les persones enllaçades, que aquest tema passa també desapercebut i és molt rellevant, inclús el conjunt o parella de fet en els permisos de conciliació amb el tema de la flexibilitat horària, tot el tema del marc de les famílies monoparentals, que no és menor, insisteixo, no és menor, el permís de naixement per la mare biològica i el permís d'adopció per la guarda de finalitats d'adopció i acolliment, disposició d'espais de cotreball en tots els departaments d'administració, és molt rellevant, tot el tema de pensar també a l'espai. I dues qüestions que no van ser aprovades al maig i que acaben de ser pactades i treballades des del nostre departament i amb presidència i amb els sindicats, el permís de dol gestacional, que és el per primera vegada es reconeix el fet d'haver patit una pèrdua gestacional entre la setmana 6 i després la baixa, que seria a partir del 179, la baixa, no, perdoneu, el permís de dol, en el que ja no solament és per la dona o persona ja estan, sinó també per tot l'entorn. És una mesura pionera, igual que la flexibilitat horària recuperable en cas de menstruació o menopàusia, que 
perquè té una afectació a la salut i benestar. Si em permeteu, perquè té a veure també amb el tema de les qüestions econòmiques, la inversió dels 20 milions que hem destinat en totes les 700 mesures que els municipis estan posant a terme en el marc de temps i cures, en el marc d'aquest programa que posa en evidència la necessitat de generar espais, no solament per les dones treballadores, sinó en especial per les dones treballadores de determinats col·lectius. Estic parlant de les dones monomarentals, de les dones migrades, que moltes vegades són precisament les que cuiden i les oblidem dintre de les polítiques de conciliació o de garantia de temps. Fixeu-vos que tota l'estona estic marcant, que estem parlant de polítiques feministes, estem marcant que la conciliació o aquest marc que segurament hem de repensar, avui no és a l'espai, però hem de repensar, com li diem, tenen a veure precisament amb aquest temps, amb fórmules que estem treballant també en el Consell de Relacions Laborals, amb aquestes mesures, per exemple, del dol i de menstruació que portarem en el proper Consell de Relacions Laborals per buscar consens amb els agents sindicals, i la patronal de Catalunya, però també amb un element important que s'està treballant dintre del Consell de Relacions Laborals precisament per fer unes recomanacions pactades, precisament per poder fer palès el dret a la desconnexió, que crec que serà és pioner i que tindrà un impacte important. I acabo amb el tema dels indicadors de salut mental. Estem treballant precisament dintre del marc del pla de l'acord que sabeu que estem tenint com a govern i que lidera la senyora Magda Casa Mitjana. Precisament és un tema que hem parlat amb ella i que anirem desenvolupant perquè ara no tinc aquí les dades després, si voleu, us podem facilitar, però sí que hi ha nombroses dades que exemplifiquen i precisament és un tema que per nosaltres i en aquest marc de Catalunya volem treballar perquè no solament per la lògica de riscos laborals, sinó perquè forma part del que deia abans, de la necessitat de generar polítiques actives en el marc, per exemple, dels plans d'igualtat. O sigui, insisteixo en aquesta història que és una transformació social, econòmica que hem de fer i també dir que hem de fer segurament una reforma no solament en l'àmbit laboral, sinó en l'àmbit d'aquest sistema capitalista que crec que necessita una proposta d'economia feminista i en aquest sentit també amb la nova consellera d'economia hem començat a parlar també de com poder generar nous marcs. Gràcies. Perfecte. Moltes gràcies, Montserrat. Gràcies a totes i a tots per els comentaris, les preguntes i a els ponentes per les seves intervencions. Ara tenim una pausa per comer, que està... Tenemos que salir a la sala de afuera y os esperamos aquí a las dos y media para la sesión de la tarde eh, sobre propuestas de investigación para una futura ley de usos del tiempo. Muchas gracias.